Okay, and we are recording and I'm really excited about um, this discussion with uh, my little brother, Ramsey Dewey. And I always say, um, I probably always say little brother because you're actually like a, a half a half an inch, a centimeter taller than uh, the, taller than me. And, and you're way, way more famous than, um, than me or like anybody in our family, except for maybe, uh, maybe like our great, great, great grandfather, Wilford, Wilford Woodruff, he might've been more famous than you are, but, but actually I should like Google Ramsey Dewey and Google Wilford Woodruff to see if you're um, more famous than he is now. But um, is that something you can do like with somebody's fame level? Is there like a standardized measurement for that? Oh, actually, so so what I um, I I was actually trying to use like Google search results to find like word frequency. Um, so uh, like I spent about I spent about a week trying to figure out um, because you know how Google says oh like there are ten million results, but um, after after doing a whole bunch of yeah. research and setting up setting a bunch of, of like automated programming stuff to like tie into that. I realized that like those when it says you have 10 million results, then it's not actually accurate. And, and it really could be like it really could be like 300 results or it could be like 7 billion results. Google just um, pretty much like picks a random number and displays it for like 99% of everything that you get back. So um, so so actually, I um, I I. I did a popularity um, search with all of my uh, with all my Facebook friends, or, or, or like all of my Facebook friends that I thought would have like Google search pages, and my uh, my friend with the most uh, results. Her name's Lindy, Lindsay Willis, and she, um, she um, she's like this Utah motocross racer, um, it, and, and I think she also like poses for photos um, too, so. So anyway, she was my most famous friend back then. So, so I'm I'm kind of guessing that you're my my most famous friend now, because um, I don't know of anyone else that has a gigantic um, YouTube. Channel. Interesting. But but, uh, but anyway, I um, oh uh, oh sorry, um, sorry sorry. Go ahead. That that is interesting. How how Google has essentially become the metric for measuring fame, at least outside of China, because you can't access Google in China without a uh, virtual private network. But yeah, this is, this is something that is very prevalent on YouTube. For example, within a relatively small community on YouTube, I'm, I'm famous, if you will. And then everybody outside of that community has no clue who I am. So it's a weird type of fame. Yeah, and it's- uh, It's a thing that didn't exist when we were kids. Because, you know, when we were kids, the only famous people were movie stars and rock stars and maybe presidents of the United States, people like that, that everybody knew. And other than that, uh, it, it just wasn't really a thing to be like a hundred thousand people know who you are type of famous. Oh, yeah. And it's um, it's it's interesting. Have have you ever uh, there's a guy in Thailand that's famous only in Thailand. Um, he's he's actually from Utah. His name is Adam Bradshaw. Have you ever heard of Adam Bradshaw? I've heard the name, but I I don't know who he is. But I have heard the name. And and maybe, maybe I might have told me about um, him before. Yeah, yeah I might have talked. I, I might have talked to you about it before. So Thailand has like sixty eight million people, and probably like sixty five million of those sixty eight million people know who Adam Bradshaw is. What? Well, um, a lot of them don't know his last name. Um, his 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 name is Ajahn Adam, and and Ajahn means teacher. So, um, so so basically, like teacher Adam is it is the way that everyone everyone calls him. Um, but, but yeah, like, um, probably like 65 million people in Thailand know about Adam Bradshaw and then probably like, um, you, me, and like three other people that aren't in Thailand know about Adam Bradshaw. So, so, so he's, um, he's just absolutely huge and, and he's from like a smaller, smaller town in like Northern, um, Utah, like cotton something. And, um, and yeah, nobody, um, I, I, I would guess that like, he, um, he, he walks, um, he walks in being like, oh yeah, I'm super famous. And everyone's like, you No, you're not famous. You're just, you're just Adam. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. So how, how is your YouTube channel going? I noticed you've been doing a lot of fascinating interviews, the interviews that 
the internet didn't necessarily ask for, but that it needs. <laughs> Um, wow, and that's a uh, that's a that's a really really nice um, endorsement. It's um, yeah, it's it's really it's really really interesting. One of the uh, one of my most favorite interviews that I've done so far. Well, it's been like a series of like three or four interviews. Is is about people who um, have stuttering or people who stutter. And, and I, I have the speech disorder of cluttering and I've, I've done a lot of videos about, about it. Cluttering and stuttering are really, really different. And, and it's really, really interesting that there's a whole bunch of stuff with stuttering that just people don't really understand. So it's really interesting, like learning about a bunch of stuff that is out there that, that like millions or like tens of millions of people experience every single day, but, um, but just the general, the general population doesn't really know anything about. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated about that. And, um, and yeah, so, 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 so I'm also, um, I'm also, I'm also really just interested in like what makes people, um, uh, well, the thing, the thing that I've always been interested in is like, when someone's really good at something, then figuring out what is it that they're really good at. And the interesting thing about that is that the stuff that I think the people are good at, usually they don't really think they're good at. So, um, so, so like so many times, like, like when I was younger, I would say, hey, you're good at this. Can you explain this to me? And the person would be like, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm not good at that. I'm good at making baskets. And, and like their baskets look horrible, but, they, uh, but that's, that's the thing that they think is they're really, really good at. They don't realize that like, like this, um, m maybe like this interpersonal skill that I realized that, oh, they're like way, way better than 99% of people at this specific thing and they're like oh oh i just do this but but the thing that I, the thing that i'm really good at is making these baskets and and so um so so anyway that um that that thing of like me seeing oh this person's really really good at it but them being like oh well um yeah yeah everyone's probably good at that the thing that i'm really good at is this other thing so so like at least in my head uh, maybe i'm just really bad at figuring out what people are good at, are good at um but no but, that, that but, makes perfect sense <laughs> That yeah, reminds me of something I've been doing lately on my, on my YouTube channel. I've been conducting this poll, maybe you've seen it, where it, it looks like a, it's this hypothetical fight tournament. If you got like all the, all the YouTube martial arts YouTubers, basically, and had them fight in a single elimination UFC one stat tournament, who would win? So I proposed the, the simple question and then just uh, put all the YouTubers stacked against each other, let people vote like who would win if they fought in a no rules type of fight. And I noticed very quickly it, it turned very much into a popularity contest, whereas the, there were these phenomenal athletes being completely overlooked by these tiny little dudes who uh, don't necessarily know how to fight that well, but, but what they do really well on their YouTube channels actually has nothing to do with fighting or very little to do with fighting. Um, a lot of times it's presentation or entertainment or uh, creating a sense of community and fun. And these people are super talented at that, more so than you know, some of the most badass fighters out there who also happen to have YouTube channels. And because of that, it resonates very deeply with people. And so I'm, I'm actually working on a, a video um, kind of about this topic, about how you know, the, the, the real talent, the real skill isn't necessarily fighting as far as YouTube martial arts goes. So it's kind of a, uh, a subversive way to go about getting that information through these polls I've been doing. Huh, and, that's, and that's interesting. So are, are, are you on, um, did you put yourself in the poll? No, I excluded anyone with a professional MMA fight record. Uh, uh, so okay. I, I think that makes it interesting because one, people would just vote for, oh, this guy's a UFC fighter who has a YouTube channel, or this guy's a giant dude who has a YouTube channel. So, so I excluded the, all, all the pros. And I also thought that was interesting because there are professionals in other combat sports, kickboxing, um, professional jujitsu, et cetera, who are also on those polls. And so I think it's a very interesting thought experiment to see how those guys would, would do in the public's estimation. And it's also, it's also taught me something really interesting 
about uh, human psychology, which is the not just the value of matchmaking as far as fights goes, but it explains a lot about, um, I don't know if you've been following all the, all the boxing drama on YouTube or heard about it. Um, the Paul brothers, Jake Paul and, and his brother, um, Logan, I think it is, have been uh, getting all these boxing fights and these guys aren't professional boxers. Well, I guess they are now because they've done pro boxing fights now, but they were YouTubers, comics, um, they did, I don't even know, I haven't really watched their channels, but uh, nothing to do with boxing. And they became incredibly famous on YouTube and parlayed that into essentially uh, boxing careers where they, they have made enormous amounts of money, more so than most other boxers who have ever, ever stepped in the ring. And the reason being, they understand what people want to see or what people think they want to see. Because what people, think they want to see as a good fight or a compelling matchup what they really want to see is a name that they recognize yeah and that's interesting about like what people think they want versus what they um what they what they want and then especially like fame on uh, fame on youtube um i and and I think I I I think I mentioned this before about the the Twitch the Twitch streamer the Twitch streamer that I talked to, and and um, so so one of the one of the things that he mentioned is that it's not it's not if you're good at playing games or not it's whether you can monologue while you're playing because people are really interested in like following along um, with that and i and i did a few videos um i have um i did a bunch of jigsaw puzzle videos i did um this jigsaw puzzle which is i think it's like 300 total pieces but like three different uh, three different uh, three different dinosaur puzzles and um, and, and, and kind of my challenge to myself was to do, um, uh, to, to do the, to do the jigsaw puzzle as I oh, am, I we're connection there. uh, okay. And, and, and I think it'll, um, I think it'll like go, um, go in, um, go in and out. So, um, yeah, um, uh, yeah. So, so my, um, uh, the thing that I, the thing that I was doing with my jigsaw puzzle video was was trying to like talk as at the same same time I was doing a jigsaw puzzle, which which for me is just incredibly difficult. And I could I I, I could see what that guy was saying about how it's like kind of a special a super specialty skill to both um, to um, to both like do something technical and to make it accessible. Um, at the uh, um, at the same time, and so um, after that, I just totally like look at um, look at look at like video game game streamers like differently, and I think that's I, um, I think that's kind of a skill that some people have that that really applies to video games um, and video game streaming. But I think it's like a decent skill. So so I've been trying to develop that, but I'm not um, like like I I've done it enough to realize that I'm really really bad at it so it's just um, it's just kind of interesting yeah man this this is something i've been thinking about and actually dabbling in quite a bit lately the the concept of presenting a skill while performing the skill which which has a lot in common with with what i do as a combat sports coach and teaching combat sports classes but it's it's importantly different for example i decided um I usually do these Q&A videos on, on YouTube where I answer people's questions. I, I sit at home and talk into a microphone and uh, people seem to like those. But I was over at the gym one day and I was like, man, I need to, haven't worked out today, I'm gonna hit the heavy bag. And I thought, but I have this long list of questions that I haven't answered yet. I'm gonna do both at the same time. So I put on a mobile microphone and, and started uh, answering qu a question while hitting the heavy bag. And it was not a great bag workout, and I don't think it was a, a great answer, but people seem to like it because something about doing an activity while uh, having a conversation with people seems to resonate very deeply with people. Now, as you probably know, 
as somebody who does not have hair on the top of your head, you probably get compared to every other bald person in the world or every, every famous bald person that even mildly resembles you. And one of those people I get compared to a lot on YouTube, and I had no idea who it was, was, uh, what's his name? The Binging with Babish guy. And I had no idea who that guy was until today. And I look him up and uh, the particular video I looked at, he's wearing a wig. I guess he's normally a bald guy. But he's wearing a wig. And I'm like, why do people think I look like this guy? But so I'm watching his video and he's wearing a wig and he's, he's cooking, kind of improvising different pizza recipes or something like that while he's narrating it and, and talking to the audience. And, and guys, what, like 8 million subscribers, something like that, very popular in the... Uh, the YouTube cooking foodie community. And I realized he's essentially doing the same thing that I'm trying to do. It's different than coaching. It's different than teaching a specific skill. It's, it's narrating, it's having a friendly conversation. It's, it's um, being personable with somebody while performing a fairly complex task. And that is a very unique skill set. And so I find uh, most successful YouTubers have mastered that skill set and often the skill they're presenting again that's that's not what they're actually the best at like again with martial arts youtubers you see this all the time guys who have a fairly intermediate level of martial arts skill or talent but they're black belts in presentation and pers uh, personability is that a real word i don't know Yeah, and I, um, I don't know if person personability is a real word um, either, but that's, uh, that's a really, really good um, point. And, 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 and I just, um, I think it's really interesting. So did you, because um, I, saw, I saw a video where you uh, were, were boxing and answering, answering questions at the same time. Um, did you just do one or is that like a new ongoing thing that you have done? I've, I've done four of them so far. Um... I did a couple hitting a heavy bag, uh, one hitting a uh, double end bag and one hitting the speed bag, which a lot of people hated because the speed bag makes a lot of noise. And so they hear the drumming in the background a lot, whereas the, uh, the punching sounds on the, bat, on the heavy bag are much more muted. And a few people were like, man, I love the sound of the speed bag. It's so cool. It's rhythmic. And other people are like, ah, it's giving me a headache. I hate this. Never do this again. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah the that, background um... noise makes a big difference. So, so I, um, I think I saw the first, uh, the first heavy bag one that you did, and that was very, very impressive. Uh, like, um, like I'm, I'm not really sure how you actually like punch and talk at the same time. So, so that's kind of a question to you: is how do you punch and talk at the same time? How do you punch and talk at the same time? Well, technically, I wasn't speaking as I was punching. It's more like punch and then talk and punch. punch, punch, punch and talk and you know you you breathe in the the uh, patterns of punching while you're punching and then you breathe in the patterns of talking while you're talking now as as a combat sports coach uh having having spent many many years uh teaching uh fighting techniques talking them through while i'm doing them it's it's an acquired skill to be able to essentially switch between these two breathing patterns I mean, the first time I tried it, uh, oh, this was a long time ago. I remember back, back in the United States, I, I uh, applied for a job at this community center where they, uh, they were looking for like a kickboxing coach. And the kickboxing coach was to cover uh, basically uh, both like practical kickboxing classes and like aerobic Taibo style kickboxing classes. And I thought, okay, I can do that. I'd never taught an aerobics class before. I had seen them, I had attended them, and I thought, okay, that, that looks pretty simple. You do the movement and talk people through the movement. And so they have me give a demo class. And I'm uh, trying to do like this type of thing, like, okay, punch and kick and whatever. And I quickly realized the breathing patterns for speaking and the breathing patterns for striking are radically different. And being able to, ra to rapidly switch between the two is a skill set I didn't have at the time. It's a skill set that you have to acquire through practice. So it's, it's always kind of alarming, right? at least it was after that when I saw aerobics instructors doing this, uh, this very high intensity movement while 
speaking casually throughout the whole thing. Um, my last YouTube video was, was about kettlebells. Somebody asked me, hey, what are some kettlebell movements that have athletic crossover to combat sports? And kettlebell around, showed some through them, explained why I thought they were good movements for combat sports, etc. And I didn't think much about it, and I put it up on, on YouTube, and I got a bunch of comments saying, did you swing a kettlebell around while speaking for 25 minutes? That's crazy. That's insane. That, that's, that takes a superhuman level of stamina. And it, it takes a certain degree of stamina, of course, to swing a kettlebell for 25 minutes. But uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, athletes can do that, right? Athletes can do that. But afterwards, I thought about it. And what they're, what they're really impressed at is this ability, which they don't even recognize, which is the ability to switch between athletic breathing and conversational breathing very quickly. Uh, that's, uh, that's really interesting. That's, that's something that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, going back to my, my speech with cluttering, what, um, one of the things with cluttering is that folks who have cluttering yeah. don't, um, don't, don't really monitor their breathing at all. And so, so I remember when I was young, and I was um, talking, and, and and this still happens to me sometimes. But I would like kind of like forget to breathe, and so I would run out of air while I'm talking. Um, and so, uh, and so, so, so I realized, well, that's uh, that, that that's kind of a skill that I can develop to like remember remember to breathe. But j just like something about me, like I naturally didn't um, don't have in my head okay well you need to take a breath as you're as you're talking like that um that doesn't really like uh, that never really like connected for me and so i'm i'm really interested in like you giving a kind of technical description of athletic breathing and then um conversational breathing and 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 like how can how can people learn how can people learn about that how can people like develop their skill in that and, and what, what is it? Okay, sure. All right, as far as athletic breathing, it's going to depend on the athletic activity. So there is as much specificity to breathing as there is to the specific sport that you are breathing in. So a simple example is powerlifting. Okay, and powerlifting, we're talking about the squat, the deadlift and the bench press. Now, what is usually used, the Valsuba, I'm probably mispronouncing that, uh, breathing method, which means you breathe in really deep. I like to breathe in through my mouth and then through my nose to hyperinflate the lungs like this. And then you hold that breath as you're performing the lift. And as you finish the lift, you can exhale. And then before you begin the next lift, the next repetition, you inhale again and you hold it. And that makes, that makes your midsection really tight. And the reason behind that, you know, your midsection just has the spinal column and no other bones supporting it. And all this squishy stuff, the, uh, the organs and the meat around the outside and not much else. And so when we inhale, we make it more rigid. And if you're wearing a weightlifting belt, uh, it gives you intra-abdominal pressure. So pressure against the belt that makes it really solid. It's like an exoskeleton, which is why ants can lift so much weight relative to their body size because they're covered in, in a skeleton. And we're not, we're soft and squishy, basically. So we're trying to emulate an ant as much as we can through our breathing method. Now, that, that's one form of athletic breathing. Now in sharp contrast, if you're punching, kicking, striking, the breathing is going to become percussive. And there's a lot of debate about this um, among strikers because you, you want to exhale when you strike for example, you can make a hissing sound ha! or a karate sound like a kia or something like that, a shout or a ha, ha, ha. but at the same time, you don't want your opponent to hear it because if they can hear it, they can time it. And if they time it, they can hit you as you're exhaling at the wrong time, at which point your body will become flaccid instead of rigid and you'll be much more prone to a TKO via a liver shot or something like that. So again, every sport has its very specific balance as far as breathing. But generally speaking, if I'm striking, I will focus only on exhaling, not on the inhale, because when you're in a hyperventilating state, 
when you're moving around, exercising, jumping around, fighting, etc., you will inhale automatically, but you won't exhale automatically. That you have to give some conscious effort toward. So a very simple way to moderate that is when you punch, breathe. When you strike, exhale, right? And, and then the body inhale, inhales on its own, okay? And that, that has uh, a bunch of great things it does for you athletically, uh, biomechanically, et cetera. Now, if you contrast that with a different sport, like say distance running, which is something you and I used to do a lot of back in the day in college, I remember you'd, you'd uh, say, hey, let's, let's go on a ridiculously long run or something like that and pretend we're marathon runners. And I remember I used to get these horrible side aches because I was very unathletic and didn't practice running and you would say essentially just suck it up it'll go away eventually something like that but i found that as far as a uh, a distance running or or swimming or any sort of um distance moving type of activity is concerned the breathing must be rhythmic and regular and yeah if, if you change the rhythm then it um it disrupts the process and that's that's different than fighting because fighting isn't the same type of rhythm and that's different than weightlifting because you're holding it. So again, every activity, depending on how you want to move, that's, that's how you breathe or how you breathe determines the way you move. Now, this is also something, um, something I studied extensively in college, uh, studying dance in, in modern dance. That was, uh, that was uh, one of the things I studied Spanish and dance the connection between breath and movement was overemphasized because it's, uh, it is one of the most important aspects of movement. Uh, if you sit front row at say a modern dance concert, you ever done that before? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. And if the music's not too loud, you will hear the dancers breathing which is in stark contrast to say classical ballet where they're trying to hold their breath and make it look effortless and, and um, try to represent these ethereal creatures that are not even human. But modern dance is very much about being human and presenting that and embracing your humanity and that is accompanied with breath. So in the modern dance movement, modern dance technique, if you will, breath always accompanies movement. We move the way we breathe and we breathe the way we move. As far as speaking goes, uh, this, this is absolutely true. If you look at people who are really good at impersonating other people, like doing caricatures and so on, they, they'll do a couple of things. One, which has nothing to do with breathing, they'll fixate on a few quirks and then they will exaggerate those quirks. Like if the guy blinks a lot, that he'll blink a lot. Or if he says a catchphrase a lot, he'll repeat the catchphrase. But if it is going to be a good impersonation where people can be like, wow, that's exactly like the guy. What they're really hearing is the cadence of the breathing. Um, what do you mean the cadence of the breathing? Ah, the cadence of the breathing. Cadence, it's a, it's a musical term. The cadence being like the, the drumming, if you will. Um, cadence is rhythm. It's, uh, it's often used in conjunction with uh, movement patterns, like how a horse trots. The horse has a certain cadence to its rhythm if it's going fast uh, or, or at a slow trot or, or simply a walking pace, that's the cadence of its movement. If there's a drummer, and he's drumming, that's a, you know, the, the cadence of the drums is, is how the drums are moving the beat, etc. As far as the cadence of speech, this is, uh, well, let me give you an example, a practical example. Star Trek, the ship's computer of the original series had this robotic voice. And back in the 70s, back in the 60s, even in the 80s and 90s, when we heard AI voices on television in the movies, what did they sound like? They had a very specific cadence, the I am a robot and I pronounce every syllable with the exact same, um, you know, this, the same space, the same tone, etc. So, so we recognize that's the robot voice, that's the computer voice, right? And 
there's the cadence when your mom is spanking you and uh, there's one slap for every syllable of your name and then don't you ever do that again gets one smack each you know that's a cadence to it right so that's probably not something a lot of kids can relate to these days i don't know speaking of spanking children my, my wife showed me something the other day um i'm going on a bit of a tangent here but that's that's something i do it's part of the cadence of my speech my brother so I don't know if you know who Kazushi Sakuraba is. He's a, a Japanese MMA fighter. Have you heard of him? No, I um, I haven't. So, okay. so tell me. That's okay. It doesn't matter. Okay, okay. But back in the day, he was he was a very famous and popular Japanese MMA fighter. He fought in Pride Fighting Championships, and you know, very good fighter, very good record. And in Japan, he was he was very well known as being a, a tough guy, right? And my wife showed me this old Pride Fighting Championship poster that was circulated in Japan. And on the poster, it had a picture of Kazushi Sakuraba lying on the floor, looking like he's scared. And then his mom is standing over him with like a stick or a wooden spoon or something like that about to beat him. And the translation from Japanese said something like, the only one who can beat Kazushi Sakuraba is his mother. Yeah. So apparently jokes about moms beating the kids are pretty universal as far as I can tell. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. And um, when you were when you were doing the um, beating imitation, I was thinking, oh, it, did, did other people's moms spank them exactly in time with one spank per um, word, or was that just uh, was was that just our our, um, our mom? But. Um, but it's inter it's interesting. So basically, you're saying that really uh, the, the comics that do really good invitations are um, have the cadence have the cadence down very very well. Is that yeah? Is that, is that basically they, they what you're get saying? The cadence of the breathing down. Um, and oh, and and, and so, that's so I think um, a perfect example. So I th I think so it's interesting that oh, you oh go ahead go. So, um, so, so it's interesting like that in, um, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so, so it's interesting with the, um, w uh, w with that, that's, uh, that's something that I've been thinking about a, a lot because I, one of my future videos is going to be um, about William Shatner's speech. And uh, because William Shatner, um, you know how um, William Shatner has like a lot of pauses and he's, uh, he said, um, uh, people people obviously ask him about it a lot and his like standard his standard answer is well the reason that I'm pausing is because I had to memorize like 10 pages of script every day and so I would pause and like try to remember the word and then um, and and maybe uh, maybe the word was permission but if I did if I didn't pause then I would accidentally say percussion and so uh, and so, and so that's the whole reason for my William Shatner pauses. So, so that's what he said. And so, and so I was thinking, I was thinking about like, like in terms of my speech, that's like, um, I thought, oh, well, that's really interesting because like that kind of, that, that kind of thing where I kind of know what I want to say, and then it doesn't actually like come out right. That, that happens all the time to me. And, um, and, um, and so, so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to make this video where I claim that the, uh, cure for cluttering is to talk like William Shatner. And, um, and it's, uh, it, 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 it's always, it, it's going to be kind of, well, and, and have you heard of, have you heard about how people think that if you, the cure for stuttering is to sing? Ha, um, ha, have you ever heard I about that heard before? That. Okay. And, uh, um, and, I and heard that uh, theory. Yes. Yeah, and on one of my on one of my interviews, uh, it was with Evan Sherman. He, um, I, I, I asked him about that because, like, like people have said, people have said that to me, like, "Oh, Joseph, you have problems with your speech." I, I, I heard that, um, I heard that if you sing, then it cures all the problems with your speech. Um, so, uh, it, and it always makes me mad whenever somebody says that because I'm like, um, well, that's. Uh, like well, and and I didn't really I didn't really understand why, but 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 when I was talking to Evan Sherman, he he kind of broke it down for about like fifteen minutes, and he said uh, basically, okay, what's what's weirder, somebody stuttering, which everyone knows about, and and you run into like 
um, one person every few weeks that um, that has stuttering or someone singing everything, which nobody does except for on musicals. Like like what's what's weirder? Um, actually, like stuttering is less weird than singing everything. So even <laughs> even if it worked, then it would just be so like like the whole point. Uh, the, the, the whole point is like trying to communicate in a way that's not so jarring to people and like if you sang everything then um, so, um, so so anyway that was uh, that was his point and and I thought oh uh, yeah that makes uh, that, that's a way to like verbalize like my like angst about like uh, why, are, why are these people telling me um, t- um, telling me like this really weird thing that probably won't even or, or, or like it won't help me at all um, and like even if it, even if it does help someone with stuttering then um, th- um, th- then yeah. So, so so anyway, I um, part of my reason for making this William Shatner video is that um, th- I always get mad when somebody says, "Hey, well, Joseph, maybe you can maybe you can get your speech better by singing everything." And um, but 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 I realized if somebody said, "Hey, Joseph, I I heard there's a cure for speech, and the cure for speech is to talk well, talk like William Shatner." Um, like, like if, if somebody said that to me, I would be like, oh, yes, that's, um, uh, it's probably wrong, but, <laughs> but it's an awesome <laughs> suggestion that, and, and I'm going to repeat it to everyone that I, um, say, um, so, so anyway, that's my, like, like, if I can memeify anything, it's to like replace singing as a cure for speech problems with talking like William Shatner as a cure for speech problems. So, so, so anyway, that's my, ulterior, that, that, that's my ulterior motive in my, um, uh, video coming up. Interesting. That, oh, oh, uh, and, and, and the whole um, and the whole point about uh, the whole point about that is that in preparation for this, I'm going to talk like William Shatner, but I realize that I'm I'm not a good imitator, and so um, I'll I'll be able to mimic the pauses, but I but and and people will probably be able to tell that I am trying to sound like William Shatner but I won't actually like, like, like there's just a really, really big disconnect. So, so that's why, uh, that's why I've been thinking about that a lot is like, well, well just, um, just pausing, just pausing. Uh, and, and I think you explained it right because my, um, I would also have to um, mimic the actual like cadence of a speech, not just the, uh, not just the pauses for me to be, to actually like talk um, in um, talking a way where people would be like, oh, okay, he's doing Shatner. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I were to um, mark down or write down the cadence of William Shatner's speech, at least like the stereotypical William Shatner impersonation, it would be like fast, 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 slow, 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 pause, slow and dramatic like that. Like da, 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 like that. If I were to sing it out there. <laughs> well, what, what do you said, though, made me think um, about why English language operas are not popular in America. And I'll tell you why. I watched one once. I saw La Boheme, a, uh, is that a French or an Italian opera? I don't remember, but uh, I don't remember the original language, but it was translated into English. So I saw La Boheme with, with some friends and everybody's singing in English. First time I'd seen or heard an opera performed in, in English. And the whole time I just found myself just cracking up, trying not to laugh because it was kind of hilarious hearing this dramatic music sung very matter of factly in English so I could understand exactly what they were saying. Because I was so used to this idea of opera is this inaccessible high class thing that average people can't understand and you're just supposed to appreciate the music. And then when there's a scene where a a couple of poor guys are complaining about how cold it is and they're like my fingers are freezing mine too like that it's uh (laughs) it's hilarious so afterwards my my friends and i were like uh, just kind of making fun of it like oh man that's hilarious what if everybody had a conversation like that let's play opera for a minute and so we did this thing from time to time where we would play opera where we would hold a conversation trying to be all dramatic and and hold out the notes and so on and have a laugh over that. But yeah, man, that's a really, really weird way to communicate. Much, much more so than stuttering, just as you said. (laughs) William Shatner, that's definitely the way to go. If you fail, as the old song says, like the great, like the good and great in story, if we fail, we fail with glory. 
which is exactly what William Shatner would do. At least that's what Captain Kirk would do. Cool, cool. Oh, and did, did I tell you that William Shatner blocked me on Twitter? And and he actually, uh, William Shatner actually like um, tweeted about me. Um, he, he blocked me and then he tweeted about me. Oh no. I, th I think so, you mentioned um, that, that he blocked you, but what did he tweet about? Um, so, so, so he tweeted, um, so, uh, um, and this, uh, uh, this is kind of a question, this is kind of a question that I have for you about, um, like, like about like at a certain level of, of popularity then, and especially with YouTube with, um, with like so many comments, um, like people, uh, people say everything. And so, so you kind yeah. of have to have a tough skin and, and me as a very like, unfamous YouTuber. It's um, so, some of my comments are really, really hard for me to like handle like, like, like mentally. So, um, so, so, so now, uh, now I can appreciate why William Shatner blocked me, but, um, but then I was like, oh, that, uh, that, that, that jerk. Um, I've been, I've been his fan. I, I, I've been, um, he, he's been in my like number, uh, well, at least like top 10 or top 20 uh, famous, uh, famous people that I look up to. And, and then this guy, like, uh, um, he, uh, he, uh, he, he called me a name and uh, he called me a name and and like lumped me in with a bunch of other um, people that he liked to block. So, so I uh, so 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 my, uh, my my tweet to William Shatner, which I didn't yeah. I, I didn't think he actually like read his tweets, um, was like kind of comparing like he was doing he did something like really really old man <laughs> old man style, and so uh, so so I basically tweeted, oh yeah um, yeah yeah um, William Shatner's kind of this. Um, and I think I said it a little more subtly than this, but that um, that basically William Shatner is um, is is kind of like old man out of touch, kind of like um, Chevy Chase on um, on um, kind of like Chevy Chase on Community, and he. Um, and he, and um, and and he, um, uh, like um, like I said, he didn't really he didn't take it very well at all. And mm -hmm. then, um, oh, oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then and then blocked me and and wrote wrote something about me. And and, and I noticed. Um, well, I um, I had to sign on like with another account to like find out what uh, or to, to see the see the tweet because I couldn't read what he read about me but, but but anyway it was just kind of interesting and so and so first I was mad at William Shatner but then I realized oh well that's um that's like something that uh like that's uh, that's hard for me and I've I've gotten like three uh three negative comments and like four neutral comments um and so uh, it, and, and I thought that like at some point you just kind of get get over it but um but but I guess with um, I guess sometimes um, so, um, sometimes you don't and, 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 and so that's kind uh, of um, that, that that's something that I want uh, that I was wondering if you could you could talk about how, is like how how you um, how um, how how you've dealt with that and and going from um, going from like a beginning a beginning you a beginning YouTuber where like nobody comments on your videos to um, now where you get like seven thousand comments on on each video and just like how to how to handle all of that um, emotionally. Okay, man, that's that's such a fascinating question. One thing, one one rule I kind of give myself for dealing with any in life is that I will try a bunch of different varied approaches so they can learn something from it. And as far as trolls, man, I've had so many different things or just people mean or disrespectful or booger, et cetera, because it happens a lot. Now it's much like um, when YouTube was brand new, the comment section on YouTube was, was just an absolute despair. It was a cesspool of the most vile, angry people you know, because communicating on the internet was still kind of in its infancy. And people had this newfound sense of anonymity. And they see people who put their faces out in public, their names out in public, their, their skills and aptitudes out on public. And for some reason, the, the internet troll was born. This guy who, who 
just wanted to get a rise out of people by by upsetting them or somebody who's had a bad day and wants to take it out on somebody else and one thing i learned right away as far as like martial arts videos on youtube or really anything as far as any athletic skill is concerned especially fighting people want to fight with you especially people who can't fight physically they want to fight with you verbally so again when my youtube channel was brand new and had less than a thousand subscribers I still got tons and tons of angry messages saying, you suck, you're the worst fighter ever. If I was in there, I'd do this and this and this. And, and I remember this, this video I put up, it got over like a million and a half views back when no videos were getting a million and a half views. It was actually before that Chris Crocker video, Leave Britney Alone, that got over a million views and everybody freaked out about it. Like what, YouTube videos can be popular? Yeah, I actually made a YouTube video that made that got over a million views before that. Nobody freaked out except the internet trolls, because what it was, it was just um, a fight that I had where I got knocked out. It was one of my early kickboxing matches and uh, a much more experienced guy and he knocked me out. But the way I labeled the video, it was Muay Thai versus Taekwondo knockout, something like that. So I immediately polarized people into two camps, the Taekwondo guys versus the Muay Thai guys. And of course, both camps, the guys who like Taekwondo come in and say, oh, that, that Taekwondo that wasn't a real, you suck, you're the worst person ever. The Muay Thai guys come over, represent their point of view, and they're like, aha, take that, you dumb Taekwondo jerks. And I th think that's the reason why it, uh, it went viral. Now, that being said, um, most of... The response in that particular video wasn't personal some of it was but i got this flood of negativity and i just kind of took it for granted okay this this is how the internet is and uh, some of it was very upsetting and you know when people say you're you're the worst guy ever you suck you're the worst person on earth uh, a small crippled child could beat you in a fight and you know just all these all these silly things uh trying to cut you to the soul you you can tell yourself that doesn't matter sticks and stones will break my bones but words will never hurt me but words have a powerful effect on us and they always will and so a comment i often get uh from people who comment on my videos because I, I read most of the comments i try to read all of them but i get so many now uh, but i read most of the comments and i reply to a lot of them and about half of the time when I reply, the response is, whoa, you actually read the comments? I wasn't expecting this. That's crazy. Nobody else reads their comments or replies to me. And it, it establishes this human connection and makes people feel special. But I had an interaction with, uh, with an angry person on YouTube who said some mean things on my last video. And I did something I'd never done before. He... Uh, he was complaining about my, uh, my kettlebell technique. I made this video again about lifting kettlebells. And, he's, and, I, and I'm using some fairly light kettlebells, 12 kilograms each for the demo in this video. And he goes on about, ah, 12 kilos, that's, that's not enough. You suck, you're a, you're a weakling. I can lift like 16 kilos. And I'm like, that's not even the point of this video. But it was an annoying comment. And I was like, I don't want to engage with with this guy i want him to learn a lesson and he's not going to learn that lesson by me saying look that's not the point of the video it's a demonstration of technique it's not an ego lifting session i can clearly lift a lot more weight than 12 kilograms or whatever but um so what i did i pinned his comment i pinned his comment at the top of my list because you can pin a comment it's the first comment everybody will see because i wanted everybody to see that comment first because it's a stupid comment. Just straight up, it's a stupid comment. And so now everybody sees that comment. It got like a hundred replies. Like, and then all of these people are telling him all these things I was thinking like, dude, it's, it's a demonstration. It's not an ego lift. He's not trying to impress anybody. Like, do you even lift and all this stuff? And the guy ad admits he's, he doesn't even use kettlebells. And everybody's like, you're complaining about his kettlebell technique and you don't even know how to use a kettlebell. This is, ah. Anyway, so... Essentially, I, I have a certain power where I can get my fans to do the fighting for me, if you will. And that was kind of awesome. 
but at the same time, I felt kind of evil doing it because now obviously this guy is, has this new level of animosity toward me. Obviously there was animosity there before, but I imagine he probably hates me now. Or since he is an internet troll after all, all the trolls was attention. So in a way I gave him exactly what he wanted. He wanted attention. And when you give a negative response, you're going to get, uh, you're going to get negativity in reply. And so that, that goes without saying. But hopefully some t teaching has, uh, has happened there. Now, back in the early days of YouTube, uh, there was this guy who went by the name White Eagle 0001. He since has deleted his account, and I'll tell you why. So this guy used to troll my videos, saying the worst horrible vile things ever. And uh, I decided, you know what? This is an, an anonymous troll. I'm going to take advantage of that. And this guy was challenging me to a death match. Like, let's let's have a secret underground death match. Like, I'm. A, he went on saying he was a Navy SEAL and a black belt in 16 different fighting styles and the toughest guy ever in like a 300 pound bodybuilder physique. And obviously, it's 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 all just you know this this made up story from this kid trying to feel special. But um, he's he's very heavily engaged in antagonizing with me, and I think. I'm going to take advantage of the fact that he is anonymous because he thinks that's his, that's his strength and really it's his weakness. And so I got uh, a friend of mine who, um, kind of a brawny guy, my friend Zach, who, who uh, you know, let's just say he kind of looked like a nerd to play the part of White Eagle 0001. So I make a video inviting White Eagle over to my gym to fight with me with $100,000 on the line, because that's what he asked for. He says, "There's a you put up $100,000, I put up $100,000, the winner takes all. So I get this briefcase filled with fake money. And I'm like, all right, White Eagle, here's the money. Come to my gym, here's the address, here's the date. Be there or else. And uh, a few days later on the day, I, I filmed this video where White Eagle shows up and it's my friend, Zach, the scrawny, scrawny little nerdy guy. And he comes in and, um, and we have this, this fake fight where I kick him in the leg once and he's like, ah, and he starts crying like a baby and limps out of the gym. And then says like, this is, gives some excuses and then runs off. So White Eagle, the real White Eagle in the comment section begins to flip out. And he's like, no guys, that wasn't me. That wasn't me guys, it was a fake. He's, he's lying to you. I'm really six foot seven and 300 pounds of solid muscle. I'm, I'm a Navy SEAL and all this stuff. And everybody in the comments starts doing my fighting for me because he just sounds so ridiculous. And they're like, dude, just own up to it. You lost the fight. Give Ramsey the $100,000. Stop making excuses. And he's like, no, no. And then I made another video where White Eagle came back and got beat up again, this time by a child. And then another video where he gets beat up by another kid. And then another one where, where he's trying to steal my grappling dummy because they're in love. And it's just completely farcical at that point. And White Eagle is just having a conniption fit in the comment section and everybody's like, dude, it's you, just own up to it because everybody's in on the joke but him apparently. And then he gets so mad, he deletes his, his uh, YouTube um, channel and he's, and he's gone. Well, he probably came back, I'm sure, under another name, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's fun to play with the trolls sometimes. I mean, they, they think it's fun to play with you, but when, when you can play with them and it's it's not something you can always do because sometimes they're just you know horrible psychopaths who uh if you engage with them you will just always have a negative experience but occasionally occasionally you can have fun with them now i usually don't i mean those are two examples you know this this recent where i pinned his comment and the white eagle video saga but sometimes i'll get a comment i'll, I'll you know first thing in the morning, I'll look through my, video, the, my, my comments and see like, okay, what kind of questions are people sending me? What kind of technique videos should I make this week? And so on. And then I just get this horribly abrasive stuff. And I'm like, ah, this is not how I want to start my day. And sometimes I'll just be like, you know what? I don't want to hear from this guy ever again. Block, boom, gone. I've got that power. And that's great. Cause I never have to hear from that guy again. Now, I've also done different things because that's not what I always do. Sometimes I do, sometimes I have. I remember when my channel started taking off, when it started becoming more popular, there was this one guy left me an angry comment. I, and I got the feeling like, 
this sounds like a guy who's having a really hard day like he's having a bad time and he's he's trying to trying to lash out and and um continue the cycle of abuse if you will and he he wrote uh, this angry comment about how much i suck and i wrote kind of a, a self-deprecating joke as as a uh, as a reply to which he replied you know what you're all right i like you man i'm subscribing and ever since that guy's been a, a, a very vocal uh, subscriber who who um you know likes my channel and supports it and so on and oh look it's my daughter eve hey, eve there's your uncle joseph so eve Hi, is eve. becoming a uh, a youtube star in her own right and we're talking about youtube fame a little bit and how to deal with with angry mean comments on the internet now one thing eve has her own youtube channel now but one thing i did i turned off the uh the comments just because um i didn't want her to have to deal with all the negativity now a lot of people they see a cute kid online they're like oh how precious what a cute child and at the same time a lot of people are just horrible and mean and awful and they say terrible things like you suck you're the worst person ever go kill yourself and just you know terrible things and again that's not something i, I want one of my daughters to deal with and she's always saying daddy turn the comments on i want to read them <laughs> so yeah and anyway. that's um that's really uh that, that's really interesting joe um I, I was listening to a joe rogan podcast where um where he kept he kept telling the he kept telling the other person hey don't read your comments don't read your comments don't read your comments and and I think he said it at least like six times during during his podcast, like advice to this other person yeah. about don't, don't read the comments. And so, so it's um, I um, I understand I understand it's good advice. Um, at the uh, at the same time, it's it um, like like a, a huge part of your community is that you're a, a part of you're a part of it and and respond regularly to the comments. And I think people really really um, li um, like that. So so I think that's really only a like not reading the comments is really only an option for. Like ultra mega famous people like um, like like Joe Rogan, but 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 speaking of um, yeah. speaking of Eve, Eve's uh, videos, um, she uh, I, um, Vanessa Vanessa posted the the video of her um, her talking to her uh, or, or, or the video with her and her teacher and and that was an awesome video. So so I'm kind of wondering if Eve can talk about like how how she became a how how she became a YouTube uh, movie maker and and why. Why is the quality of your YouTube video so good? What do you think, Eve? Um. You know, if I were to say something um, before before Eve answers that question, uh, Eve has taught herself video editing. Like um, w when she started out, she would say, "Daddy, help me, help me do this," and and I would say. Uh, essentially, if, if you learn how to do this yourself, you, you can make videos whenever you want. And so she taught herself how to edit videos and make her own music. She yeah, makes her own music on her, her uh, YouTube channel, which, which is really cool. Because, man, uh, modern technology makes making electronic music incredibly easy. But, um, yeah, could you rephrase the question one more time for Eve? Um, well, well, actually, I, I have a new question now is what, um, what's the next video that Eve is going to make? I think it's going to be another movie. Oh, another awesome. movie. Yeah. Awesome. Because I, I really like, um, I really like movies. So Eve, do you think, do you think you're better than your dad at making movies or do you think your dad <laughs> is better than you at making movies? Yeah, uh, because I, I, I'm not really sure dad because I see... Um, I see your movies and I and I think they're really good um, and, and and very very fun. And then I see your dad's movies and and they're also good. But I'm not really sure who's who's the who's better at making movies. Well, I think I am. I am because <laughs> because Daddy never makes a lot of movies. Yeah. You oh yeah. Um, that's uh, okay. that's a good point um, because. Um, because it, it, um, it, and I think he made, um, he made some movies a long, long time ago, but, but, um, and, yeah. and, and some, um, sometimes he does like martial arts, um, uh, martial arts kind of skits uh, that are like mini, mini movies, With but Elmo. Not, Elmo. Yeah. not movie, not funny, um, Cinder <laughs> Elmo movies. 
Oh, have, have you seen he, Eve's uh, Cinder Elmo? He doesn't do. Parody? He doesn't do Cinder Elmo. He just does Elmo. It's it's, it's just Elmo. It, it's quite the production. And and I haven't seen Cinder El Cinder Elmo yet. Um, what's um, what's Cinder Elmo? Um, Cinder Elmo um, is about a boy who thinks he's a girl and <laughs> and, and there are some complex gender issues here. In this, uh, in this video. yes, Elmo thinks he's a girl, but he's a boy, and um, he's like, let let me wear a dress, goat. I want to go to the ball and wear a dress because my sisters are so mean to me. And then, and then I'm like, aren't you not supposed to wear a dress? You're a boy. You're supposed to wear a suit. And I'm like, just do your thing. And then he makes him wear a suit, and and then he's like, ew. What is this? This is trash. Give me a dress. So then he wears a dress. <laughs> it's super ridiculous. And he's like, I'm just so beautiful. Now let me marry the Princess Eve. And then Eve rejects him and calls him a um gum a gremlin. Ga gremlin. And then he goes to jail and he comes out cleaning again with his family. Cool. And, and, he and never who, goes to who who plays the Princess Eve? Me. Oh, awesome. <laughs> So, so is the is the princess Eve a good princess or a bad princess? She's um, a weird princess. Uh, uh, okay. What um, what uh, what what makes her that way? Because she thinks Elmo is a gremlin, even though he's not green. She judges a book by the cover. <laughs> it's a fairly uh, small role. Cool. And, but I and record. What, what's that? I I recorded. And I, I hold it almost sometimes. She, she was the puppet operator and, uh, and the camera. I director, I'm director. And the too, director. Too, yeah. Cool, and, and you also made a video in Chinese too, right? I'm reading a poem and um, like line poems, that one. Uh, uh, okay, and, and which, um, what, what, do you like, what do you like making better, English videos or Chinese videos? I think English. How come? Because Chinese, um, it, it takes a long time to memorize it, like memorize the lines. Um, so I was gonna do a homework assignment with my mom and we did it, but like m mom and me were having so much, um, it, it's so hard to re recognize the lines and it took a long time until mommy and me knew it. Uh, okay. Mm. And then you know it is it is kind of hard to yeah. memorize Chinese lines. Memorize it. But but you speak Chinese. I yeah, speak I Chinese. Do. But but some things that are not easy Chinese is super hard to remember. Not not easy kind of Chinese. So do you think um do do you think Chinese is easy to learn or do you think Chinese is hard to learn? I think it's medium. But for other uh, kids, it's like impossible for them. So what? Why? Yeah. Why is it impossible for some kids? Why is it impossible for some kids to learn Chinese? Because, um, because some kids, um, they, they, they come from other countries and they're very new. Like they have been here for some months and they just like, they, um, they just like speaking their. Um, language they think they think it's comfortable and it's super hard for them to learn a new language when they're old like maybe like I think seven or eight uh, uh, okay. seven or eight is old wow yeah and, and who um, who who speaks better Chinese you or your mom uh, my mom and then who speaks so. better yeah. Chinese you you or your dad uh, me <laughs> <laughs> And, so, and uh, I'm I'm up. Um. So so the best is mommy. Then it's me. Then my sister. Then it's my dad. Oh, so so <laughs> your 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 dad is the worst person in the whole house at Chinese. <laughs> the absolute worst. Yes. They can all have secret <laughs> conversations around me. And then he doesn't know, and he's like, "What are they saying? What, what uh, are they saying?" So. So do you ever speak Chinese with your dad? Um, not really. You know, anytime I've tried to speak Chinese to Eve or to <laughs> Ivy, they always tell me to stop. They're like, Daddy, just stop it. Stop speaking Chinese. Speak English. 
<laughs> it's because he's not pronouncing it right and I get confused. And they mock and laugh. Do you remember when we were kids and we used to we used to poke fun at her mom because of her English accent and she'd say things like, uh, the source of the sauce instead of the source of the sauce or something like that. And uh, and how um, the word sore, saw, sore, um, and, and five other words that sound uh, very different in American English are exactly the same in, in uh, Northern British English. And we'd, we'd all giggle about it. And she would get all mad and be like, just you wait till you have children. Well, um, I have children. They're doing the exact same thing to me now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Eve, what's, uh, what's an example of something that your dad um, always says wrong in Chinese? I don't remember. It was a Basically long time ago. Basically everything. <laughs> <laughs> but what is pretty good. He says what the best. I say what? 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 Any. What? What I need. Yeah, he says that he he's good at that. And and what does so, "wo so, I need" mean? Um, that means I love you. Oh, okay. That uh, that's uh, that's really cool. So if um. So so if you had a friend and like if you had a friend in America and they wanted to learn uh, a word in Chinese, what would you what what word would you teach them? Mm, I don't know. What, what they want to say, I just ask them what you want to learn. And they're like, what is the basics? And then I'm like, wa, ni, what else? Um, cool, tian, xiao, da, er. Um, let me think of another one. Xiao. Um, you know, Joseph, you should totally red, do a crossover e with R, Eve San, on another episode o, of Easy Liu, Qi, Cheesy ba, Chinese. Um, <laughs> what? What did you say? For anybody watching this who doesn't know what Easy Cheesy Chinese is, it's probably the greatest Chinese language learning system the internet has ever known, and uh, Joseph has it up on his YouTube channel. Yeah, it's um, yeah, um, yeah, and and it's kind of a um, I made it I, I made it to be funny. But I realized that like a lot of the um, a lot of the like philosophy in that is kind of the same as my like language learning and just like general general learning philosophy too. So so it's kind of it's kind of interesting. And and all all the Chinese speakers that I've um, showed it to are like, no, it's wrong. You're saying everything wrong. Uh, but uh, but that's kind of um, th 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 that's kind of my point is that. Even though even though you're gonna say stuff wrong the first time, then you should try versus like not uh, not try like like try and you're gonna get it wrong and then I'm coming back after that. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, try yeah. it. Uh, What's even funnier and... about Chinese is where you write broke the characters in the wrong order. <laughs> so, for example, the character you went over, uh, Ren, uh, which means person. And it's it's that uh, those two lines. If you write those two lines in the wrong order, even if it looks exactly the same, and a Chinese person sees you writing it that way, they will say, "No, that's wrong." I, I conducted an experiment where uh, I got a bunch of Chinese folks, and I had drawn the characters with the correct stroke order and the incorrect stroke order on the on the blackboard. They looked identical, and I I showed the characters and I said, uh, "Are these characters written correctly?" And they said, yes, because they didn't see me write them. And I said, this is how I wrote them. And then I write the characters, one with the correct stroke order, and they're like, yes, this is correct. And one with the incorrect stroke order, and they're like, this is incorrect. And I said, well, they look identical. And they're like, no, no, it makes it, 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 it's very important. You have to use the right stroke order or else. I guess it goes back to uh, calligraphy. If you're writing with an actual brush and you use the wrong stroke order, you're going you're gonna to muddle the lines up. But as far as printing something, I don't think it really makes that big of a difference. But culturally, it does. Yeah, that's a that's a fascinating thing about um, Chinese. I um, I've got a friend that I work with, and she's from she's Chinese ethnically. Like her great great grandparents are, um, are um, moved from China to Malaysia, and um, it, um, and so her mom sent her to Chinese school. And, and I realized that, like at, at the time, because I was studying um, Chinese, or um, like, like I, I had a workbook where I was studying a little bit how to write write Chinese, 
And I realized that um, after talking to her that I actually knew more Chinese characters than she did. Um, but but she, um, she, spe she speaks Chinese really well, just, um, just she, she doesn't like writing it. And, and she told me about like this experience, like, like she said, oh yeah, I, I, I hate writing Chinese characters because, uh, and then she told me about that, that her mom sent her to school and then, and they're so like obsessed about stroke order. And so, um, so, so she's like, yeah, I, I, I'm okay speaking Chinese, but I, yeah, I, 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 my interest level in actually writing it is zero. But, but now, uh, now she lives in the US and uh, I don't, um, and I don't think she does, she speaks much in Chinese now but 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 yeah it's it's really it's yeah. really interesting that, that is the biggest drawback about the chinese language is, is the writing system and it's also its biggest strength because there are over 400 different languages and dialects in china which is something a lot of people don't know it's a very linguistically diverse place especially historically i mean more and more and more people learn mandarin or, or speak it as a native language, but historically, I mean, there have been massively divergent uh, linguistic groups in China. And so the idea of having the common language or the common tongue, Putonghua, which is common tongue in Chinese, that's what you call uh, one of the names for, uh, for Mandarin Chinese. That, that's, that's the whole idea to um, be a lingua franca for this uh, previously giant, fairly ununited, as far as linguistics goes, empire turned republic so where was i going with that i'm feeling like william shatner trying to remember the next line of the line um but yeah but as far as a, a written language and this is what discourages so many people this is why chinese has been very difficult for me to learn whereas uh languages that use the latin alphabet i find are quite quite easy to to learn and to study simply because I can read them right away as soon as I learn how to pronounce the letters, boom, I'm good. But since Chinese is iconographic, it's, uh, and you have to learn a whole new character for every single word, and, and often not even a word, a, a single morpheme can have a, an iconographic character, and then you combine those together to, to form new words. And it's, um, it's fairly complex and it takes many years to learn how to write and to read in Chinese. So, but the advantage being once you do learn how to read and write in it, you can communicate with any one in China, any of these 400 diverse languages and dialects can communicate through writing. So that's the, uh, the rhyme and the reason behind this overly complicated writing system. I mean, technically, you, you could use Chinese characters to communicate or to write any language, like you could write English in Chinese characters. It would sound kind of weird, like the, the syntax wouldn't, uh, wouldn't follow English syntax, but you could write English with Chinese characters or really any other language. And, you know, historically, some, some of the civilizations have done this, like um, there was uh, the hymn to Aten. I don't know if you've, you've heard of that. It's, uh, it was found in an Egyptian tomb and it puzzled people for a very long time because it was written in Egyptian characters, but it didn't really seem to make sense for the longest time until a particular linguist realized it's Egyptian characters, but it's, they're writing Hebrew words with Egyptian characters. And so the hymn to Aten is basically one of the Psalms from the Bible, but, um, Instead of uh, using the word Jehovah, they use um, Osiris uh, and, and names of Egyptian deities. But the whole linguistic process was long, one language being written in the characters of another language. So that's, that is the rhyme and the reason behind uh, the complexity of the Chinese writing system, which is beautiful in one sense and incredibly frustrating if you just want to pick up and play as far as languages go. Ah, and that's um, that, uh, that's interesting. So, so a question that I have, kind of related to, uh, um, kind of related to that in the writing system is is um, pinyin. Pinyin is the English transliteration of Chinese, right? Yeah, th there are actually a couple of different romanizations of Chinese. The the most modern, um, widely used one is pinyin, and uh, the 
outdated one, the Wade Giles one, that's that's the one where we usually see we if if you use English words like kung fu, for example, which is spelled K-U-N-G-F-U, that, that's Wade Giles. Um, the the actual word in Chinese pronoun is pronounced gong fu. Wait, with, wait, with wait, did um uh, did, did Ramsey Dewey just say F U on my um YouTube um channel? Um uh, now did I, I say F U. Oh, Gung you, you were Fu, not F U. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so, so, um, so, um, so, um, so, um, so, sorry, sorry, you're just you're just usually very very clean. So, um. yeah. Anyway, both both writing systems are kind of a mess. Uh, opinion is makes a lot more sense than Wade Giles because Wade Giles, for example, again makes spells the G sound with a K, which makes zero sense at all. And we'll see it in other things like uh, the name, Tai Chi, right? Everybody in, in English uses the phrase Tai Chi for, for Tai Ji or Tai Ji Twin. In Mandarin, it's a J, it's a J sound, J, Tai Ji, G, like that. But for some reason in English, we use the old, J, the old Wei Giles spelling CH to make a J sound. Like in, in what language does that make sense? Not in English uh, and not in any other language I've, I've studied but yeah, the opinion has, has its own weirdness to it. For example, if you want to spell the sound R, it's spelled E-R. Why not A-R? But instead E-R, right? And then um, what else? But then the E can also make an uh sound in Wade Giles. It can be that R, they followed by an R, but it can also be a uh sound. And the, the big problem with um, with relying on pinyin, though, is that Mandarin has a very limited number of sounds. And so we have a lot of words, a ton of words, hundreds and hundreds of, of homonyms, thousands of homonyms, words that sound exactly the same. And the only way to tell the difference between the words is context and the characters. And so a lot of times I'll have uh, American friends say, hey, Ramsey, what, what does ma mean in Chinese? And you're like, uh, well, that depends. You know, M-A, what does that mean in Chinese? I'm like, that means like 500 different things. There are four, like 500 different words that can be spelled that way in Pinyin. And of course there are tones, there are four different tones, but there are like 500 words that sound like ma, 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 right? 500 different words, not just four. And again, the difference, the characters, because each character is different depending on the word and the context. So, and context is so incredibly important in Chinese. Like one of the, my spoken Chinese is terrible, uh, but my, uh, my listening skills in Chinese are much better because I've trained myself to listen for context, contextual clues. And that, that's really important for learning any language. That's, that was a big part of learning Spanish, just listening for contextual clues in the speech, like observing what the people are actually speaking about visibly. And then you can start picking up on the verbal cues later. Anyway, how's the Thai language study going? Um, it's going... Uh, it's going pretty slowly, but I got a uh, I got a new book series. Uh, this is called Ma Money. Uh, this this says money, um, and it's um, this this little girl right here is money. So 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 it's like a big cultural thing. They, they've had these money books for like three hundred years. Um, that's why mm. uh, that's why she's wearing like. Um, super super old school tie um, tie tie clothes, and this is called mana mani, um, and I think uh, like one of these boys is mana, and um, and then this is uh, um, this one's mani, so um, so um, so so it's like the kids um, it's like the kids book, and um, I have a um, I have a Thai teacher that I'm using, um, but um, have have I told you about have I told you about her yet? Um, so. Um, oh, so so tr um, Thai um, Thai teachers, like traditional Thai teachers, are really really bad. Um, and, and, and I've talked about that. Like, there's no like feed, feedback loop because like students can't question their teachers. It's like a big, um, it's like a big like 
no no in Thailand. A faux pas. And, yeah, yeah, and um, and so, um, and so, and, and so you get teachers like teaching like farther and farther and farther and farther and farther away from like students actually learning, and the teacher doesn't like get any like feedback uh, feedback loop, and so. Um, and so a lot of a lot of the Thai teachers just like lecture all the time and then are, uh, are um, you remember the video you made um, error correction is the lowest form of coaching. Um, so, yes. So, so, so when I, when I watch that, when I watch that video where you repeated that phrase um, a little too often, um, I um, just every single time I thought, oh, yeah, this is exactly this is exactly the way that Thai teachers um, teach teach the Thai language. So, so, so I actually found um, I actually found somebody that doesn't um, doesn't really speak English very well, do, um, doesn't have any background in Thai at all, and I said, hey, well, I'm going to um, I, I'm going to pay you to teach me Thai, and she said, well, I, do, I, I don't know anything about um, I don't know anything about teaching, and I said, well, that's why I picked you um, because you're not gonna you're not gonna lecture me, you're not gonna speak down to me, you're um, you're you're gonna be okay if. You're going to be okay if I ask you questions. Um, all the stuff that you don't get with the, like a traditional Thai teacher. So, um, so um, that status. Yeah, yeah, and um, and then um, like like um, I'm I'm kind of using it like as a workshop for me to like test out my theories on teaching teaching methods. So um, so so we do uh, we do like a few activities. One um, one of the activities is she'll say. Uh, she'll say a word, and then I have to like guess what tone it is, and and I'm really really bad at that. I just like after five minutes of that, I get really really frustrated because I can only guess like one out of, or five tones. I can only guess like one out of every four times, uh, like what what the tone is. Um, but uh, but then, um, but but then we have other activities where like I practice reading because I'm like my my reading skill is pretty good, um, and then. Uh, and then we do a lot where she says something, and then I repeat what she's saying so that I can kind of get the uh, get get the tones and the and the speech in my in my head. So um, so so that's been that's been pretty cool. So so one of the things I wanted to mention about Pinyin is that in, interestingly in Thailand, there um, there there aren't just two systems like there are in Chinese. There are like thousands of different systems, and mm. um, and then most. Most Thai teachers are just like kind of write out whatever, uh, whatever it is that they, um, whatever it is that they want, um, and so and, and like switch uh, switch back and forth between systems. So, um, so so just like if if you see a Thai transliteration, it's it's terrible because like most of the systems aren't really that good anyway. But 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 if if they're consistent, then it's not really bad because you can say okay, well this. Um, the spelling is probably one of these three words um, if it's consistent, but if it's not consistent, like the spelling could be any of like 7,000 different words. And, and, and Thai is, Thai is sure. interesting because because um, because Ma and Thai only uh, like there are five tones in Thai, like like Chinese, but Ma and Thai really only means three different words, horse, dog, and come like come here. Um, so and, and, and um, th they do have like su um, two super obscure words, so they can say, "Hey, yeah, we're we're just like Chinese, ma 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 ma." But um, but but really, there are only three words that people actually like use that are ma. But 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 the word my, uh, the word my actually has like I think about like, well, all five um, all five tones. Like like if you say my in all five tones, and then and, and then Thai also has like long sounds and short sounds, so so ma can like technically be pronounced ten different ways. Um, but, but only like three of those are actually like valid, valid words. So, oh, welcome. Uh, welcome back, you. Hi. <laughs> yeah, man, that's, that's fascinating. When I, I think fixating on tones is one of the worst things for, for a uh, foreigner to be taught. And yet it's, it's like the first lesson you get when you study a tonal language like we're gonna learn all of, all about tones and here, here are chinese tones simplified for you and i think this is all that really needs to be said about them as far as teaching tones to americans there's the singing tone they call it the first tone but forget about that 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 will not help you to memorize it's the first tone that doesn't matter it's the singing tone where you hold a note like 
ma ma like that right just one pitch then there's the angry tone where you're like shouting it angrily ma ma that's the last one is that's, that's 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 the fourth tone is yeah, it? The fourth okay tone. and then there's the you got punched in the gut tone ma ma so your voice kind of goes down and then up again ma yeah ma. and then you got the question tone ma ma, ma. like you're asking a question <laughs> And that is how you teach tones. And if somebody would have just told me that on day one, I would have been like, okay, that makes sense. But instead, they do all these lines with their fingers, like, it's like this, like this. It's, like this. it's so it's simple. Like this. Your voice it's just like goes this. like that. Like, voices do not move like fingers. Your voice goes like this. No, it has to go Your like this. Your voice goes like this. No. Like this, like this. And they try to draw out lines in the air. It's, it's very, very confusing. And then they move their heads like this, this, this. And this. And then they will always say, ah, it is difficult for you to learn because English does not have tones. False, absolutely false. English has all kinds of tones, but the tones like, are like, like emotive. Like question mark, like question mark. Sure. The, the tones are emotive, interrogative, etc. Uh, for sure, the question mark is a great example. The question mark is a great example. I just turned that statement into a question by changing the tone, but then it, it becomes much more nuanced. <laughs> in terms of emotive, um, expressing ideas, sarcasm, et cetera. And, and this is something Chinese doesn't do with tones, so they do it with, with uh, little affix words, almost like emoticons inserted into a sentence, like when you're texting something and you're like, oh man, is, is this guy gonna know that I'm trying to be sarcastic? I'll put a little sarcastic face right there, ha ha. Um, so Chinese has like, uh, several hundred little words you can add to a sentence to to convey the emotion or or uh you know sarcasm etc and it works virtually the same way emoticons do in text but in english we do that with tones so we don't need those four five hundred extra words because we do that with the tone um i mean you know exactly when somebody is telling a joke you know exactly when somebody is being sarcastic and how do we do that? Tone. Uh, yes, the tone of the speech, exactly. And you laugh. And this can be something very difficult to, to teach to say a, a Chinese uh, native speaker. And you can, I, I love throwing that argument right, right back at them. You don't understand sarcasm because, <laughs> because your, your, la your language processes it differently not tonally like English does. And they're like, what? English does have tones, mind blowing. Anyway. My, um, my mind's blown too. Yeah, um, yeah. Thailand has a lot of those like emoticon words too. Um, and, and they translate into, well, like Thai people use them in English um, too. Like a lot of times people will say na, na ka, which is just like, um, na, um, na is like a softening word. And then ka is like the polite word for women. Um, so, 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 so like people will say, oh, we'll have a, um, um, so, um, sorry to bother you, naka. Um, li li like, like combining English and Thai together. So it's, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. And then yeah. one, um, th uh, this is, uh, this is kind of a random, um, a random like thing about Thai, but one, um, one of the things is that in, in Thai, when the second letter is either R or L, then in speech, then uh, th then in speech, then people drop that sound, and so so like a lot of the like a lot of the Thai uh, uh, Muay Thai um, fighters, um, pr uh, you're probably pronouncing their name like 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 officially, but uh, but but like if, if R or L is the second letter in a in a syllable then like like in speech they won't actually say it so so like the word um krap um, mm. uh, um K K -R -A -P, which is the like the polite word for men um the 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 most popular way of saying that is cop just completely dropping the completely dropping the r and um and so huh. and so, um and so so there's kind of there's kind so of this said, krap, that would make you sound like a picture an actor uh, yeah, and so if, if and like um, it sounds way too formal. Yeah, and so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really it, it's really it, it's really formal, and 
Um, and, and there's a, there's another, like the ultra polite word is, is kapom, but like, like, but the official way to say it is krapom. Um, but, but, but everyone just says kapom, even though that's like really, really, um, really, really polite any, um, anyway. So, so, so like if you're, if you're talking to a police officer, then you would say krap, 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 or you might say that to your boss. Uh, like if he's the big boss in the company, but but like generally, um, generally like people just say cop instead of crop, and oh oh and mm. and, and 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 my whole my whole point, which isn't really a point anyway, is that is that it, it's kind of like translated like in reverse back to English. So one of one of the um, so okay is a word in Thai, um, and, and actually my um, um, a Thai a Thai friend pointed out that. Um, um, to me that okay exists in every single language. So, so if you're learning a, another language, then as long as you know okay, then you know at least one word in, in your target language because just every, it's a like universal word everywhere. So, so the interesting thing about okay in, in Thai is that there's a slang where they put the R into okay. Um, which you would, which you wouldn't pronounce anyway. So, so it's so they basically spell it O K R A Y, um, and so so that's something that like when when I first saw that like people saying okay but spelling it O K R A Y, um, I thought oh this is awesome. So so, so that's my uh, that's my new that's my new thing is to misspell O K R A Y as O K R A Y um, just because like that's how the cool Thai kids um, do it. O K R A Y. Kind of like the Chinese expression, the the Chinese English expression, okay la. But how would you even translate that? And um, what, okay. like if a Chinese person says okay la. And and um, that that you can't you can't. You can't really translate it, but and, it's it's just something people say. Wait, and pizza in Chinese is pizza, but with a different tone. How so how do you say pizza, pizza in Chinese? Um, uh. It, it kind of sounds weird, like someone from China says pizza in English. <laughs> I don't, I don't know how to say it. I, I'm not a Chinese oh, person speaking English. And and I have a, um, I have a. Uh, this is this is my dictionary saying pizza in Thai. So uh, tell me if it's anything like pizza in Chinese. Pizza, pizza, pizza. Um, it doesn't have an a, but. Um, and it doesn't go up; it kind of goes like a little down. Uh -uh. But it's but it's kind of kind the angry of, tone. Um, it's the angry tone. Pizza. <laughs> not pizza. like that. Not like that. It's like you say pizza really angry. No. Pizza. <laughs> the pizza is here. <laughs> no, it's kind of it's kind of the the um the first tone and the last tone. It's in the middle. Uh, uh okay. And then it's not um, super here angry. So, so here's um, here's a um, Thai, Thai borrows a lot of words from English, um, and one of the words uh, one of the words that also has like a slang like like there's a lot of Thai slang words that are in English but they don't actually exist in English. So, so like one one, one um, and, and a lot of them are, are abbreviations. Like Thai Thai people like to abbreviate stuff. So one is inter i n t e r. And uh, can you guess what inter means to a Thai person? Hmm, no. Okay, now I know how to say pizza in Chinese. It has okay. the first tone and the last tone. Pizza. Yeah, it wow, has the first go. tone and the uh, last tone. That, that um, you, sound, you sound just like a Chinese person. <laughs> can you use it in a Chinese sentence? Um, can you say the pizza is here? Uh, this is gonna be hard. Uh, can you say I like to eat pizza? I I don't like saying pizza in sentences. It's so hard. I can't be a Chinese person learning English. I'm an English person learning Chinese. I know how to say that in Chinese. Come on, you were born and raised here. <laughs> it's hard for me. <laughs> Okay, so, so so while um uh, while while um while Eve is getting up the courage to say 
I want a pizza in Chinese. Then, uh, then I want to talk about the word furniture. Oh, oh, and and, and to answer the question about inter, uh, what that uh, what that means is it's an abbreviation for international. Ah, weird. Yeah, very, very, uh, wow, <laughs> very, very weird. And um, so, so, so it, um, well, I'll, I'll, re I'll repeat this back when Eve, Eve comes back. This is how you say furniture in Thai. Furniture, furniture, furniture. One more time. I know the words. Furniture. That's furniture in Thai, Eve. Okay. Furniture. Furniture. Just kind of um, up the stone. Furniture. <laughs> yeah, and so, oh, wow, um, Eve can speak Thai really well. In your group? <laughs> so, so one more, um, one more furniture, 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 and and so furniture. so the so the so the kind of like abbreviation, like the the uh, or, or the like common way to say furniture is just fu. Um, and and a lot of the like, like there's a furniture store um, th that I think they have two branches. It's called Fur Nine, F U R dash Nine, and I was like Fur Nine. Yeah. Um, but but I realized oh it's like fu as in furniture. Um, so 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 Eve, how do you say furniture in Chinese? Um. Or I I don't know if that's a word you would know you would know yet. <laughs> Maybe a specific piece of furniture. Um, I'm thinking. Like a couch Wait, or a I table need, or a sofa. To... Let me think. Chozi, <laughs> yuzu, um. <laughs> Let me think. What else? A bed? How do you say bed in Chinese? Um, let me think. Is is the item like like that's the item? Okay, let me say desk. Let me try to say desk. Um, is desk table in Chinese? I don't know. <laughs> Chinese is a fascinating language in terms of the types of anglicisms that it borrows from English. Like almost every language does this these days. They, they borrow words from English, usually to replace words that don't exist in those languages. The Chinese is weird because it reappropriates its own words a lot to make more complex technical words. But then it borrows some really random words from English that it didn't really need to, like bye okay bye. and bye bye. Like people say bye bye instead of the actual Chinese word zai jin, which means goodbye. I mean, they'll say that, but it's really common, especially in Shanghai or one of the bigger cities in, in Shanghai for people to simply bid you farewell by saying bye-bye. But in a weird accent. Yeah, bye-bye, yes. bye-bye, like that. I don't know how to say that. Um, but then you look at something like a, a phone. It's It literally means electric speech or uh, a computer is an electric brain. And- <laughs> It's just weird, it's weird. The, yeah. To translate it in, the for two two words that go together it's, it's like for example apple um ping guo ping guo like guo is means any fruit and then ping um is not a word by itself so it doesn't have a meaning by itself it just goes with other things it sounds good i guess that makes sense we, we do that a little bit with fruits in english too like uh a grapefruit, sort of. I mean, grape by itself is a totally different fruit, but add that to fruit and suddenly it's it's a citrus fruit instead of grapes, which doesn't really make any sense. Or like dragon fruit. We do it with animals sometimes, like a wildebeest. Like What's well, a wilda? There's no such thing as a wilda, but there is such thing as a beast. But put wilda onto beast and suddenly it's it's a whole new animal. Like dragon fruit, it, it's not a dragon, but but it just adds <laughs> fruit and it's it's a fruit now. It's Speaking of fruit. dragon fruits and fruits in general, so Joseph, you've been making this excellent series of uh, videos on how to eat the lesser known in the West fruits of Southeast Asia, which I find absolutely fascinating because as a child, these are all fruits I never saw, but since moving to Shanghai, these are really, really common here. So how, uh, how has this series been going over? I really wish more people would watch it. So, um, so, so, so kind of the well, the thing that the thing that I want to do um, is, uh, and I don't know, I don't know if you've noticed the recurring theme is that 
on every single one of my videos is like how to eat like whatever fruit. And, and it's kind of like my way of being funny is I say, oh, well you eat it like an apple. Um, so, so like every, like no matter what, uh, no matter what it is, I'm claiming that the way to eat it is like an apple. And so, so I'm expecting, I'm expecting people to say, oh, dude, you're eating it wrong because like, uh, like, like with a dragon fruit, like you can eat it with like an apple and I, and I do eat it like an apple, but, um, and, and that's the way, uh, well, actually like most of the, um, like, like when I'm eating it at home, I always eat it like an apple. I, I ate one for breakfast this morning and, um, and ate it just the same way as I ate it on my video. Yeah. And now that you mentioned it, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, because I, I just saw your how to eat a guava one and and I remember you saying you eat it like an apple and I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> he said that about dragon fruit too. And I was thinking there, there's, there are many much more convenient ways to, uh, to peel a dragon fruit besides, you know, removing the, the skin in, in like one solid piece like you did, like, like just scoop it out with a spoon or something and you can do that in seconds. And I just kept lingering over that, like, does Joseph not know how to just scoop the dragon fruit out? I mean, it's... It's the simplest possible way, and um, so so if you think if you think you eat all the fruit like an apple, you eat a tiny grape as as your mouth opens as wide as you have to eat an apple. Maybe you should. Oh make my gosh, a video you're um, eat a this uh, this is why Eve is a YouTube video genius. Um, you need to be my producer for the um, how to eat uh, whatever fruit series. So so one of my upcoming. One of my upcoming videos is going to be on um, papaya. Um, you guys have yeah. papaya in China, right? Yeah. And um, and so I'm um, like, like I'm gonna I'm gonna peel it or like have one pre-peeled and say, okay, this is uh, th this is a peeled papaya. How do you eat it? Oh, you eat it just like an apple. Um, and but I. Uh, I'm I'm worried about the seeds because I'm gonna like eat all the seeds and that's uh, papayas have a lot of seeds and um, yeah. and and so I need to like I need to build up my tolerance to papaya seeds before I just go and like eat a whole papayas worth of of seeds. But that's oh, um, uh, that's a that's an upcoming video in my series. And and, and papayas got to be pretty. Do big, they have durian so. in Thailand? Um, yeah, it's. Do, do they have durian in Thailand? Yeah, the big spicy I, fruit. Oh, yeah, I don't think oh, I don't yeah, think I can. That one that can. Hurt you. I don't think you I can eat that like, those, in... like apples, Wait, but... I, I watched something on YouTube. It said durian. If you eat too much durian, you will die. Hey, that's what uh, anything, that's what some people told me no, too. No, no, like, one one time, this guy ate five durian and he's dead. Five whole ones. Yeah. Five. Well, durians weigh like five kilos each, for a fairly small one. So, man, that wouldn't even fit in your stomach. Buddy, buddy. Like, it, it would be kind of funny though if you you peel it, get to the fruit in the middle, then pick up the fruit in the middle and say, and then you eat it like an apple, and then just go at it. it <laughs> oh, and still actually, work. um, so so Thailand sells like shrink wrapped, um, shrink wrapped durian sections, and and Thai Thai durian is really unripe. Like a lot of Thai food is oh. unripe, so it's. Um, like, like people in Malaysia really usually don't like Thai durian and the Thai people don't like Malaysia durian because, um, because in Malaysia you wait till the durian falls off the tree and in Thailand, I think they, um, they hack, hack it off the tree before it's, um, well before it falls off. Mm. So, so I, I, I actually haven't had Thai durian yet, but that's a, uh, that's a great idea for, for a future video. <laughs> So, so Eve, what, the, uh, so, so Eve, Eve what, what, what fruits have you tried in China? Um, it's, it's um, yellow stars. I don't know how to say that. Oh, star fruit? Yeah. Have yeah. you had that? Star yeah. Fruit. Star I fruit? had that in here. Yeah, it was new to me. I never tasted that in Shanghai before. And until we went to the hotel. Basically, you ate it like an apple. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't eat it like an apple. Like, I ate it. I ate it on like I ate like tiny pieces because it's not as huge as an apple. Kind of has a tomato type taste. Yeah. Kind of like a persimmon. It's a I yellow thought. tomato. Yellow tomato. I think they're both nightshades. It's tomato. Ah, uh, and what um what are some other fruits that you have tried? 
in China? I don't. I don't remember. Mm. Did you know? You Have you had kumquats? They're pretty common here. What's kumquats? They're like these tiny little oranges, but but not like the mandarin oranges where the peel comes off easily. Mm. Like they're little oranges and they're hard to peel. And you can actually eat the peel. I never peeled a tongquat, so I don't know um, um, if I ate it one. You, you can eat the peel, but it's kind of bitter. So if you like uh, British marmalade with with uh, the wait, orange wait. peel mixed in with it, then but, you'll probably like kumquats with the but peel But I, I have some small oranges at my school and the the things, um, what are they? The small oranges at my school and the peels are pretty thick. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's that. I'm, have I'm, you had lychee? I think that's how it's pronounced. I, I don't remember the Chinese name. It's um, it's this weird fruit. It's white on the inside and kind of purplish. It's got a purplish hard husk and you peel that and then it's white and squishy and it's got some seeds in it. And it's... I usually eat strawberries. Yeah. What's what's that other one? The jujubes or jujubes? Or... That's another um, very Chinese fruit. Man, there's this one. I don't remember the name of it. But it looks like something you'd see on an alien planet. It's like this fruit made of like all these little tendrils that stick together and it's red and juicy and it has one like pit in the middle, kind of like a cherry. But um, but it's an alien fruit. Yeah, man, it looks like fruit you would expect to see on Star Trek. But they never eat it. Does that sound even vaguely familiar? No, um, but it sounds it sounds awesome. Yeah, man, next time you come to China, we should do a, a run of the fruit stores, although Fruit is totally seasonal here, because if it's out of season, you won't find it. It's not like America, where they have the same fruits in every grocery store year-round. Um, so right now, it's it's strawberry, strawberry. and uh, mandarin orange season yeah. in Shanghai. So that's those are the because big it's the you'll winter and kind of kind of almost raining like one month or two months. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I I, I, I have a question about mandarin. I have a question about mandarin oranges because yeah. in in Thailand almost all of the mandarin oranges have so many seeds like after after I've eaten an orange then I have a pile of seeds that's almost as big as the orange was. <laughs> and so so I'm wondering if, if if those are just Thai mandarin oranges that have so many seeds or if the mandarin oranges in China actually are have so many so many seeds like, well, like they do in Thailand. It it, it depends. Generally, if you go to the fruit store to buy mandarin oranges, there are like three or four different piles of oranges with different price tags. And on them. some of them are expensive. One of, yeah, and the one of them is the most ones. expensive. I think it's the yes. most seeds or the less seeds. Usually less less seeds or no seeds for the more expensive ones. And then the cheaper ones will often be the ones with seeds. Yeah. And uh, but but that, that depends. It depends on the type of store. Some some of them will separate them on seed quality, and other ones will just sell the older fruit for a cheaper price. And then you are fruit for a, a, a higher price. Handsome store. So it's kind of hard to tell what you're going to get. But uh, yeah, I remember you talking about the, the really seedy mandarin oranges in Thailand. And it's it's not that common to find super seedy ones here. So I'm guessing they probably just ship all the uh, seedy ones over to Thailand. Yeah. <laughs> because they, they don't want that. They're like, they won't notice at all that we have seeds inside our things. They think we cleaned it, but we did not. Or, or maybe it, it might be that the the Thais actually enjoy the seeds. Yeah. Um. Because here's something about Chinese culture I didn't know before I got here. Chinese people love eating, um, eating meat with lots of bone and gristle in it. I hate that. Uh, yeah, it's it's a very Americans are totally not into that. We like big chunks of lean meat with no bones or gristle. We but, don't want to eat bones. But uh, I, I think it's just historically because meat, is, historically speaking in China, was fairly scarce. And so when you got it, it was generally, um, you know, the, the, the bones with the gristle and stuff on it. And so they, uh, a lot of Chinese dishes are adapted around that, that style of cooking. And so now there's, there's this cultural attitude that it tastes better with the bones on it. The more bones, the better, basically. So more expensive for the bones. Yes. So, so, the, so Americans are good. They're, one of the most good. expensive things to get, uh, if you go to buy pork, for example, the cut of lean pork, just the pure meat, is one of the cheaper pieces of pork. The more expensive is a bunch of bones and gristle. 
same thing with chicken. Uh, lean chicken breast, skinless, boneless chicken breast, cheapest cut of, of, of the chicken, the most expensive, the chicken feet, and of course the chicken wings because it has the most bone and cartilage in it. I don't eat the bones of the chicken wings, but I love the chicken wings too. Yeah. And chicken eggs, but I don't eat the bones. So you should ask your Thai friends if how much they actually enjoy the seeds because maybe they really love them. Maybe they've been culturally conditioned to love seeds. Uh, and yeah, I. Uh, that's a good question that I never pictured eating the mandarin orange seeds, but I've never, I've also never actually seen a Thai person with a pile of seeds, like a giant pile of seeds. So maybe yeah. they are, uh, maybe they are eating the, um, maybe they are eating the seeds of the mandarin oranges and not spitting them out like I am. So uh, maybe uh, yeah, maybe but... I'm the equivalent of a waterman wat watermelon seed spitter here because um, you know how some some people like spit out and and, and it's just like a it, it would just be a huge chore to spit out all the seeds of a watermelon and I've, well, I've seen this, a few this people is a massive revelation that, that could totally revolutionize your how to eat fruit series. Yeah. Um, you... One thing in, in China you might see, especially in Shanghai, they eat a lot of shrimp or prawns or whatever you want to call them. Shrimp. And what's shrimp again? Oh yeah, it's that little yeah. pink thing. Yeah, those little pink sea animals. They're right? delicious. Yeah, they're delicious, exactly. And it's very common to cook shrimp in, in Shanghai or really anywhere in China by putting a bunch of delicious sauces all over the and, shrimp with the shells still And on. sometimes I, I usually like shrimp with rice, um, beans, and corn. Yeah. Now if, if and you sauce. If sauce. you peel the shrimp, then you don't get to taste all of the sauce. Yeah. And so it, it seems really strange to an American, like I'm gonna peel this, I'm gonna get my fingers all messy, I'm gonna put the shrimp in my mouth and I'm not gonna eat all of this. I'm not even going to get to taste the sauce it was cooked in. What's up with that? But then you watch the way that uh, Chinese people, at least old Chinese people eat them. They stick the whole shrimp shell and all in their mouth and then somehow are able to spit out just the shell with 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 all the meat gone, it's like this uh, the skill they have acquired over years of practice, just sticking a whole shrimp with the shell and the legs it's and everything hard. on, and that. then spitting it out without the meat. I wish I had that power. Yeah, I wish. Useful. I wish I had that power um, too. I um, see um, seafood's a little bit tough for me to figure out how to actually eat. Uh, um, especially like the medium-sized yeah. shrimp. Um, like, are you supposed to eat the whole thing, or are you supposed to um, spit it spit it out? When, um, I I was I was eating pork ribs with uh, with some friends, and I and I thought I was pretty pretty aggressive eating all the like gristle and stuff like that. And so so I ate like a lot, and then I put uh, and I put like the bone and some some of the harder gristle out. And then one of my friends scolded me. He's like. You're supposed to eat that. That's uh, that's good to eat. I was like, um. Wait, do you okay. have to eat bones? Do they eat um, bones? Uh, no, uh, no, not um, not um, not the. Um, not, oh, I don't like not that. The, uh, not not the bones, but like the harder the the harder like fatty or like tendony stuff. I don't, that... I, I, uh, I don't like that. that. Yeah. Do, I don't do like you... eating the hard thing. What about chicken feet? Do you like eat, do you, eating chicken feet? Yeah, I like chicken feet. You do? Interesting. They, um, they have yeah, a lot of I, hard- I find more and more that it's very culturally Chinese in many, many ways. For example, chicken feet, if you tell the average American, would you like to eat chicken feet? They will stare at you like you're a lunatic. Whereas in China, chicken feet are, mm. chicken feet are a big deal. People like them. People think they're tasty. There, there's snacks you can buy at stores, like like jerky treats, basically in America, or you can buy them prepared at a gourmet restaurant with all kinds of sauces and stuff. People, people love them. It's good. And and for some reason, I don't like cake, sweet cake. I don't like too much cake. Oh yes, this is another huge cultural difference. Um, the Chinese predilection to eschew sweetness like uh you know when i was a kid and and 
Yeah, you understand this because we grew up in a household where, where our mom just uh, didn't want to let us eat sugar. And I remember one time we went out and bought some candy and she got all mad and took it away and threw it in the garbage. Like, oh, no, no, no sugar for you. And you we went through these waves of not having any sugar at all you, to an extreme. You should have eat, eaten it secretly. And so, <laughs> and so in my mind, sugar was... <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Sugar was this very coveted thing, like you never have enough sugar. Sugar is the best thing ever. And so I, I before I even came to China, I, I met some Chinese friends, friends of Vanessa's, and we invited them over for dinner and for dessert. We had chocolate brownies with vanilla ice cream on them, fairly typical American dessert. And they'd never had it before. They took a few bites and then they started like clutching their throats like they're gagging to death and they're like it burns oh it's too sweet uh, like they were just dying and in horrible pain and it's a similar reaction to like you give somebody a super hot pepper for the first time and, and they're just like ah, burning to death inside that that's not me i can eat brownies but not too much cake i'm kind of half american half chinese so why 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 don't you like to eat cake it, it's too much makes me throw up mm, like I, like i i can eat half of the piece like maybe this much of the cake and then afterwards i'm like please don't make me eat more and and then i'm like when i take a long time off then i start eating rest and then like um it, then a few minutes later i eat again and then a few minutes later after the rest i eat again it's like that because I, I get full of cake very quickly. Uh, so, so do you do you have cake yeah, for a, your? There's a radically different set of flavors in China than in America, man. But but the Chinese cake tastes disgusting. I like the American cake better. Chinese cake and all this is pretty weird. Yeah, it's weird. So so do you have cake for your birthday, or do you have something else like brownies? I have cupcakes. Oh, so so are cupcake? Do you like cupcakes? Yeah, I like cupcakes more than cake, but but I get a cake. I get a cake for my my friends who like cake because they like cake, but maybe I don't like cake, so I eat a little bit of amount and then I give it to my mom, and then she eats the rest. Uh, and, so and my friends eat everything, all the cake, and the cupcakes. So why do you like cupcakes, but you don't like cake? Um, it's because cupcakes are not as big as cake. They're smaller. They're, they're uh -huh. a size of a cup. It's a cupcake. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, that's uh, that's a, a good it's, reason. It's in paper cup. So, what's um, Eve? What's your favorite Chinese dessert? Um, hmm. Can we say like not sweet dessert? Or we just yeah, yeah. Any um, any dessert because well, in Thailand, a lot of the desserts aren't very sweet this at all. Yeah, same thing in China. A lot of Chinese desserts are not sweet at all, like uh, uh, red lotus root stuffed with red rice. Totally not sweet, but it's still considered a dessert. Um, is rice considered a dessert? I don't know dessert in China, but I know foods Have you I had like. Chinese red rice. Um, I had purple rice yeah it's, it's it's basically that dark blackish purple color but they call it red rice okay so is that can scissors at a dessert yes that's a chinese dessert okay then i would say that because purple rice is pretty good purple rice is is that the same as rice berry what's rice berries oh um, that's um, what they um that's what they call like a sweeter purpley rice in Thailand. I don't know. I don't know if it's like a Thai I don't word like or... Sweet rice. I don't like sweet rice. I like rice, not sweet rice. Uh, mm. Okay. And then, uh, Eve, because... Eve, what's what's your favorite Chinese food? Noodles. What, um, what, what kind of noodles? Like noodle soup or like ramen noodles or what kind of noodles? Chicken. Noodles with chicken inside, chicken uh, pieces. Cool. And, and where do you? Ramen yeah. Or in China? Ramen. ramen with chicken, big chicken pieces inside. 
which actually oh, isn't that Chinese of a dish. That's that's something that I make for more than often than not. It's in so, the stores. You you found it in stores? Yeah, I found it in stores. Hmm. So where where do you usually eat um, noodles with chicken? Mm, in my house. Uh -uh. And um, do, do you make it or does your mom make it or your dad? It, I bought it from the store. Oh, okay. And and then you just have to fry it. Like um, put hot water inside and wait and then stir it. Ramen noodles with chicken. That's that's your favorite thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. And then, um, oh, so, so, so I have another question because you know how your dad eats a lot because he's a, he's a martial artist. So he, he, um, has to eat like lots and lots of food to keep his muscles big. Yeah. So, but, um, but oh, go ahead. Oh, this, there was something funny that happened yesterday while we were, we were waiting for Chinese New Year. Um, so, so daddy, daddy, um, we were eating dumplings, we were eating dumplings and daddy was super scared of getting chocolate dumplings because, because he thought oh, it was going to taste yeah. disgusting. So, and, and then I got like two chocolate dumplings and, and daddy's like, what's wrong with me? Why does she love it so much? Yeah. We made dumplings for Chinese new year. That's how they practice. And then you're like, who eats, that's how they celebrate who, Chinese new year. Who eats, who eats chocolate dumpling noodles? And I, I had never heard of this tradition before in all the 12 years I've been here, but Vanessa insisted the, uh, chocolate. there was a Chinese tradition of putting a chocolate inside one of the dumplings. And then the person who gets the chocolate is the lucky one. And yeah. so we made not one, but four chocolate dumplings in the midst of all these pork dumplings. For one and for dad, one for mom, one for me, and one for I. My big fear was I'm dipping these in soy sauce <laughs> with, with garlic and uh, and sesame oil and and um, vinegar and stuff like that because that's that's the dipping sauce for pork dumplings. And I'm thinking I do not want to dip a chocolate dumpling in soy sauce because that would be gross. So then then he um, what's that word that starts with the A? Um, that a word that makes you worried that stress anxiety yeah anxiety he has anxiety for eating <laughs> and and then they're like we should have not did this now dad is not comfortable eating his um his um dumplings and and i'm i'm having anxiety of where is the chocolate dumplings but daddy's having anxiety where's not the chocolate dumpling i want to know where it is so i don't eat that so it's different but Ivy just threw it up on the ground. Like she threw it and then- yeah, Ivy like, got Ivy... sick last night. Oh, she... so. it, it's not bad. She she threw um the dumpling with the chocolate up because she didn't like the chocolate taste. But um, but when, when making the dumplings, um, she didn't wash her hands. Um, so she had raw meat and then she used her hands with the raw meat on it and then ate it. Now she has food poisoning. Sad story. Yeah. Wow that uh, that is a that is a sad story. I, I I hope she gets better. Is she still sick right now? She's sleeping. She, uh, okay. she doesn't like doing anything. So the couch. So, I don't know why. Um, so so I have a I have a question about um, your dad uh, um, because your uh, your dad your dad eats eats a lot so that he can have big muscles. So I think um, I think at one time he was eating about twelve eggs a day. Um, not, uh, not, not exactly like Rocky because he always cooks, um, his eggs, but, um, but, but my question is what's, what's something that's a little bit strange that your dad eats that is actually really delicious? Um, what do you mean? Like, I think it's oh. strange, but other people think it's delicious. Um, like yeah, um, yeah. Uh, be, uh, well, because like, like most people don't eat 12 eggs a day, I think. Um, and I don't know. I don't know if your dad still does uh, uh, does that, but but you but eat probably both eggs a day. In a while, but I do eat a lot of eggs. He eats a lot of eggs every every time. So so example, he's like um, when mom and um, Ivy were at school and we were at home. He's like, "What do you want for breakfast?" Um, I you know I'm like, "I'm hungry," and then he's like, "How about eggs and bacon?" <laughs> and he and then for lunchtime, and he's like. 
I, I'm hungry, Dad. And then Dad's like, how about eggs and bacon? And then <laughs> oh, for dinner. <laughs> no, you did that. You <laughs> did that. And then you added toast and, and meat. You added meat. But there's always eggs. And for dinner, he couldn't say eggs because Mom and Ivy didn't feel like having eggs. But he could, uh, uh, okay. he, he could sometimes put the eggs for dinner. Apparently, three meals of steak and eggs and bacon and toast were uh, <laughs> were too much for you. <laughs> <laughs> It's like every time I ask, I say, Dad, I'm hungry. He always says eggs and bacon. And then for lunch, he says eggs and bacon. So is, is but your dad... When I choose, I say soon. So is your dad good at cooking eggs and bacon? Um, yeah. <laughs> cool. Of course, why would, why would he want to eat so much eggs and bacon? Oh, that's, uh, that's a good point. Good. Um, because he makes them so delicious that um that that's his that favorite he can't that's... handle not eating them uh, uh, uh okay so so maybe that's uh, yeah, maybe I, that's I got a strange comment maybe that's the whole reason that your dad got are into... you talking about the comment that uh, maybe that's the whole reason that your dad got into martial arts is because he realized his <laughs> eggs and bacon are so delicious and he realized that oh if i uh, if I just eat all the eggs and bacon that I need to because these are so delicious, then I'll then I'll just get really fat. So I need to figure out some way that I can work out, and and that's why he got into martial arts is all because of his egg, eggs and bacon. Exactly, that's exactly. Yeah, why. because he had too many delicious eggs and bacon. He's like, oh no, I put it too bad. I must go to martial arts because my eggs and bacon are too delicious. <laughs> and it will make you fat. <laughs> it will make you fat. Oh my. He adds he adds butter inside them. Fat. And cheese. So wow. Oh, and one time one time daddy didn't exercise and he had no muscles. What? Yeah. <laughs> when did this yeah. happen? <laughs> but a little bit of muscles. <laughs> I didn't see a lot of muscles, but he when he flexed he had a little bit of muscles, but no, it happened um, when when you didn't train a lot and you were at home. Are you talking about during the the uh, coronavirus lockdown? Yeah, yeah. He he was he didn't have muscles at all. He didn't even want to train. Apparently, I turned train. into a stick man. Yeah, you turned. into didn't train. Stick. Yeah, you didn't train. You only did like ten push-ups a day. That, that's what ten I push-ups a day. That's yeah. it. <laughs> yes. You That's all I had. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and and you you didn't have lots of muscles. So... Apparently, I turned into a stick man. <laughs> no, I mean you were fat. But, um, I was fat. And, yeah, no, you're. Kind of... <laughs> okay, um, you're you're kind of big, and then have not that much muscle. You have to see the picture of him I, in the I bathroom. Like in the picture. bathroom without his shirt. I would like to see this picture of me. <laughs> you didn't give it to me though, but. But, but, um, I'm very curious what it looks like. <laughs> you were in the back room, and then, and then I came up to you, like, Dad, where's your muscles? Where are And um, it's the truth. It's the truth. And because your brain is small. <laughs> <laughs> this child. Already. Is. <laughs> so. Yeah, he has brain that forgets things. My easily. brain is small. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're forgetting your, your, your remembering brain is small. Yeah, that's what I mean. Your rem your rem mem memory memory My brain. Is yes, it's yes, it's small. Mm. You don't know stories. I know lots of stories. I know more stories than him. I know. I know old. Stories. So. Ah, <laughs> uh, so Joseph, I, I want to talk to you about um, about your Master Wong book review, but. I'm thinking we should totally do that on my podcast. Okay. Um, and yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So let's see here. I think the battery is running low here on my my phone, so I may have to may have to check out here. One question. Okay. Were, best question. Were you recording a YouTube video or were you just chatting for a YouTube video? Um, re recording a YouTube video. 
Okay, then then why are you guys just chatting about life? Um, because my uh, uh, because, uh, because because this is going on my, on my on my YouTube and we and and um, what, what my YouTube is about is more about chatting about life. And so when we when we record for your dad's YouTube, then it'll be more about like martial arts and like Ramsey related stuff. Is oh, this live and, or is not? Um, it like no, it's not. Um, it's not live. I'll I'll publish it in about a week and a half. Can so any um, any. It? Can I see it? What's that? Can I see it? Is your YouTube channel called Joseph Dewey? Yeah. My YouTube channel is called Joseph yes, Dewey. How, how did you know? Okay. So your YouTube channel, your YouTube channels is Ramsey Dewey and Joseph Dewey. You just it's just your name. Yeah, because we're brothers. Can you tell? Yeah, you are both bald. That's <laughs> that's the distinguishing characteristic. And you both have um shaved beards. And that are soft. Oh yeah, I forgot. I need to touch you. Oh. <laughs> okay, so so as a final um, as a final as a final comment, Mark was talking about Ivy this morning. Um, uh, Mark, oh, um, Uncle um, Uncle Mark. So, um, so 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 he was talking about Ivy and New Plymouth. And and Eve, you've you, you remember New Plymouth, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's been a long time since you were there. Uh, what is is it a person or a place? It's it's Idaho. Do you remember going to Idaho to uh, my hometown? Um, did we see horses? Yeah, there were horses. Oh yeah, there. yeah. I thought you were talking about a carriage or a um. There's lots of things. Yeah, like that Ferris wheel, and and pizza, and <laughs> <laughs> um. I'm just remembering the movie that we watched where Batman, Batman. Batman said something about pizza. Can you can you say it with your voice? Oh, we just watched oh, yeah. Batman versus the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And then Batman said something for pizza. At the end of the movie, Batman in his distinctive Batman voice says, "It's pizza time." And then and then him, his son like, "What is?" I don't know what that has to do with Idaho, but uh, there we go. Oh okay. yeah, because I um, mean, your 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 mom your mom gave us pizza. Your mom oh. gave us pizza. Oh yeah, your grandmother. Yeah. Yes. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. So, 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 Mark, um, Mark said, "Well, Ivy isn't really wild in New Plymouth." But he, uh, um, I, I just thought it was interesting because I do. Oh, like Ivy the plant. Um. Well, uh, um. Yeah, yeah. That's that's what he was talking about. But I was thinking about how maybe Mark was just making commentary that Ivy is usually wild, um, like. Like with Eve's example of of um, handling raw uh, raw meat and then getting sick, um, but then when she goes to New and Plymouth, also then... touched a burning pan. She, she touched she touched a burning pan. Oh no! Because because mom said go touch the handle, not the pan. And then Ivy's like, okay, let me touch the pan because she said not to touch the pan. So Ivy was going to touch it with her whole hand. Then the mom grabbed this and then she touched it with one finger. Oh wow! Uh, so your mom, it. your mom saved her from a really really bad burn. That's cool. Kind of, kind of, but but one hand's burned and it has a black thing. Wow! So so um, so, kid, so, so what so you should do? What should you you should do? Um, the parents should know how to teach children because. If if the parents do this, children will never make mistakes. So if parents just say, um, like, go and burn yourself on the pan, then the children will think, oh, I don't want to do that. That's sounds dangerous. So they realize um, why their parents are not doing that. So they're like, mom. You're telling me parents should tell their children to burn themselves on purpose? Yeah, so they realize, oh, my gosh, I don't want to burn myself on the pan. So he's going to tell them what to happen and say to Are do it. Are you saying the children will do exactly the opposite of yes. what their parents tell yes. them to do? Yes. Huh. Oh, that's um, that's, true because, that's good. Because, because they they at least know that they don't want to get burnt. So if they say that, then they will like, no, I don't want to do that. And I don't want to do that. That's, that's not cool. Yeah. That, uh, that sounds like good parenting advice uh, for me. So thanks. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for sharing that. And then, um, Eve, any... Any anything else you want to say on my YouTube channel before we wrap up? Um. So, do you, is your YouTube channel about talking about life and fruits? 
Um, it's it's about a, it's about a few different things. It's it, it's not like your dad's because because um, your dad's all about martial arts and very focused and, on martial and arts. Art. And uh, and so mine uh, mine is about like sometimes about jigsaw puzzles, sometimes about eating fruit, sometimes about doing interviews with people, um, sometimes about um, speech and the speech thing called cluttering, um, sometimes about other stuff. So it's it's about like a lot of stuff. Oh, and I and I wanted I, I wanted to be about about Thai language too, but I don't know Thai very well. Um, do you do you have like a video that um shows up to go and help you know what? Um, what is this YouTube channel about? Um, like I dads? think the, oh yeah, I think, oh, I think mine is actually, yeah. I think mine like that is the one that I got the most negative comments on. And that was me singing a Christmas song. And one of the, one of the negative comments was you've ruined Christmas. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, what? Um, so I think it was so bad that that it hurt Christmas. Um, yeah, yeah, I um, I don't know. So 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 I think I, I think I just really liked all of the negative comments I got on that um, on that video, and so I think that's what? the one that I have. One thing, my... if Dad Dad said to all the YouTubers out there, if you make a mistake, leave it so all the comments go up, and then he's gonna get more popular. Oh yeah, that's one of my secrets. One of my secrets about uh, about making a Don't video go viral. Don't in the YouTube channel. They will not know. And that is make some really obvious but subtle mistakes that you know people will nitpick about in an otherwise flawless video where, where all the facts are, are set very straight. And people will comment on that thousands and thousands of times and all the extra comments will boost the visibility in the YouTube algorithm. Yes. To a tremendous effect. The more annoying that one little thing is, the better. So for example. Do not post this part on YouTube. For example, uh, I did a review um, of this Japanese cartoon called Attack on Titan. And I was reviewing the fight choreography in this, in this video because some of my subscribers said, Ramsey, you should do a review of this fight choreography and let us know if it's any good or if you use this in real life well, for you point there's this uh you know how japanese cartoon characters all look like girls even if they're even if they're men they have this very mm -hmm. effeminate look about them like long flowing hair and you know very feminine features and eyelashes so there's one of these characters and he's supposed to be a man, but he looks very, very feminine. He's up on the wall, like shouting something. And in the middle of this exchange of these two Titans fighting each other, I say, oh, and there's some blonde girl up on the wall. And apparently this is one of the main characters beloved by the fans who is totally a man that looks like a woman. I got 10,000 comments like that's, that's a man, it's not a woman. How could you say that? Oh, I just died when he said that guy was a man or a woman instead of a man. Anyway, oh yes, tiny little things like that to set people off will get you so many comments. And then you'll be famous. People might hate your guts for it, but like you said, then you will be famous. Internet famous. That's the only <laughs> way. <laughs> because YouTube doesn't read the comments. They they just they just think everyone's nice on the internet. They they don't judge your mistakes. They think everything on YouTube is perfect. Perfect. On comments. But they don't, the robots don't have real brains. They don't read. You don't have much faith in the YouTube algorithms? Yeah, I don't like the robots. I mean, and then they take down a YouTube video, even though it's super beautiful. And they just use a little bit of the copyright music. And then, and then they're like, oh, because of copyright violations. Yeah. Yeah, you got to be and, careful with that. And, and it's so, it's it's the best thing ever. Like all the people love it and they don't even know it's copyright, but they love it. And the people who know it's copyright, they they say that the, robo ro the robots don't even take their time looking at how joyful this YouTube channel is. You know, that's why we is. make our own music for YouTube oh, videos. Oh yeah, yeah. So we can avoid copyright claims. Yeah, but I'm still really mad about that. Well, I would be mad. Uh, I would be a, mad too. Because, like, you made this YouTube channel for fourteen years, and then, because um, for some reason, on iMovie, for example, Daddy got a guitar playing sound that looked like 
the other sounded like the other song. Um, oh yeah, you're talking yeah. about that one video I made where I got a copyright claim because I, I made actually made my own music, but I, I sampled yeah. some some sounds from from some other songs, and, and one of which was a, a very short guitar riff, and and uh, I mean musicians do this all the time, especially uh, hip hop, rap, electronic music, etc. They sample sounds from from other songs, but it's like this two second guitar lick, and. Uh, because of that, it was identified as being the same song as this other one. So look at the original. It sounds nothing like alike, but at one point I recognized that guitar lick comes out once as opposed to like repeated rhythmically. And, and it's, uh, I was like, wow, that's, uh, that's shocking that like two seconds of audio can, uh, can be identified like that. Not cool, man. Seriously. Anyway, yeah, not, does uh, that. Uh, the not, YouTube not, robots not cool. are pretty ruthless. Not they don't they don't care about people. They don't care <laughs> about feelings. They are robots after all. Yeah, but but the people who make the robots need to care about people too. I gotta say the uh, the robot uprising of the future is way different than it was portrayed in science fiction when we were kids, Joseph. Instead of uh, taking over the world and um, enslaving us all. Through force, they've uh, taken over the world and enslaved us all through uh, internet. the internet. True, really true. So true, so true. And all the humans, all the humans, all the humans on the internet, they they need to not do the copyright music, or then the robots will go and kick them out of this this thing. Even though your YouTube videos are all so good, and they don't even care. They're, and let that be listened to you. Yeah. They're like, they think they're the queens and the kings. <laughs> and, and we're all the slaves. We have to make it. We have to make this hard work for like 14 or 15 years. And then afterwards, come back. You have guitar sound. And then bye bye. Your YouTube channel explodes. Hmm, but not in the good way. Yeah. Bad way. So wow. So I um, so I think that's a great uh, final message for the video. So so thanks um, thanks Ramsey, thanks Eve for um, doing this YouTube uh, video with me, and it was great talking to you. Yeah, thanks Joseph. Cut the part out with Daddy's secret. <laughs> oh, um, you can leave that in. You have my permission. <laughs> no, no, please. Okay. Because other uh, people will get it. Other people will. Uh, uh, okay. Other people yeah, that's can take a. Right idea and then they will be famous more than dad that he needs to be the, more than dad and you you have to be the most famous it's it's not about being most famous eve it's about it what is it about what is youtube about it's about uh you know the whole reason i started a youtube channel was so to you practice did. speaking to other people just to practice talking to people yeah. that, that was a skill that i felt i lacked at the time, 14 years ago when I started. And you wanted to be a teacher. You wanted to be a teacher. being able to have a conversation. Yeah, and convey and teach information in a more effective way. Yeah. So essentially- Well, for me, for me is making funny skits and making people laugh. Yeah. I, I'm already very good at talking to people. And that is why conversations like this are awesome. Thanks again for the opportunity, Joseph. Thanks very and, much. And uh, yeah. So then cut the part out that I said, don't sh share the secrets. <laughs> okay, and, <laughs> um, and, then, um, and then can you, um, yeah, can you both say, get out there and train? Yes, okay. thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Now get out there Brain. and train.